Gaming ecosystems. They do this by replacing standard concrete with their own special cement formulas. As opposed to regular cement-based concrete, e-concrete includes certain elements uh, that enhance the growth of marine flora and fauna of plants and animals. Our admix, which is kind of our secret sauce, is basically kind of sealing the concrete, making it less aggressive for the marine environment. That once we add it, we enable life to flourish. In the lab, the team run tests to identify what mixes will work best for marine life. So we take really ice cube sized concrete slabs of different compositions and we put larvae, 20, 30, 50. We need to have a lot of replicates. We're geeky scientists, so we have to have a lot of replication and controls. And then within a few days or just a few weeks, we can get an answer on uh, their preference. So obviously if they die, they have a very low tolerance to that specific concrete mix design. And if they thrive or they flourish, we can quantify that uh, very quickly. E-concrete says it typically sees double the biodiversity of regular grey concrete. From fish and sea caterpillars on their armour blocks to crabs on these tidal pools that sit on the shoreline. This unit holds water uh, during the low tide, so it's always moist. And therefore it has um, a very comfortable habitat for uh, crabs and sea anemones and sea stars, etc. These pools have been here for less than three months. And this is already what you can see. It's covered with life see the rock around it, which has been here for probably 10, 20, maybe even more years, only has a thin layer of green algae and that's it. As well as the composition of the cement mix, Econcrete designs its products specifically to the marine environment it will be deployed, to create niches for endangered species or to develop nurseries like these oyster beds. The final part of the equation is creating complex surface textures to mimic natural rock or coral an environment that helps anchor young organisms. When concrete elements are being cast, the typical goal is to have a very slick uh, surface, very, very smooth. The idea is to get the water to flow right across it. When we are designing e-concrete with a rough surface, we want to do the complete opposite. We want to slow the water when they are crossing the structure so that the larvae can actually adhere uh, and attach to the surface. Concrete has to offer its clients more than just ecological credentials. Over time, they've discovered that creating hospitable habitats for marine life adds another advantage, one that is surely hard to ignore. We've seen evidence to the fact that the growth of the organisms on the concrete create kind of a layer of defense. Just the addition of weight, we can actually gain stability and strength over time. This is the, let's say, the, the unit when we put it in the water. And this is after a year in the water. And what you can see here is all the oysters are completely covering it. We designed the units so they can withstand the forces and perform in terms of structural performance, but they can also be a backbone for uh, ecological enhancement. The company tests its miniature designs in tanks full of real seawater, rocks, plants, and animal life from around the world. What we're looking for is the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the surface of the concrete of, by, of different mixes and different designs. This is the process that we call it biogenic buildup. So with time, we get a buildup of calcium carbonate that is sourced from marine organisms on the surface of the concrete. And we actually encapsulate the concrete with a natural rock. So when the organism die, in the case of a coral, it will die and then another coral will sit on it and that's how a reef is growing. The hope that our man-made structures could become stronger over time also means better economics. The units require less maintenance and could therefore stay in the water for longer. E-concrete though is just a few years old, so it needs more time to really quantify the longevity of its products. But the company are certain their products are better for the environment, and not just in terms of improving biodiversity. We're kind of trying to offset some of that immense carbon footprint of the concrete industry. Construction is responsible for about 11% of global carbon emissions. By adding a biological crust to their products, e-concrete prevents some CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. For every kilogram of uh, calcium carbonate being created by those marine organisms, we're offsetting 120 grams of CO2. So think about building a port infrastructure or a city waterfront that is an active carbon sink. 
I think that's a great advantage of the technology. That does it for this week, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Follow us at Climate. I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. is Bloomberg Business Week. Inside from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. And we're back at New York headquarters for we made Bloomberg. It. We made it. Although made there was it. more snow again this morning. It's even still, well, maybe just coming off the buildings. It was relentless. <laughs> That's what it feels like this month. Hey, you know what they call that, Tim? Winter. Yeah, I know. Kind of ish. You're right. All right. It is Friday. TGIF, everyone. February 19th. Carol Master, Tim Stanovic in our Interactive Brokers studio in New York City. Stock slipping back, but uh, not Bitcoin. Another record. Another day, another <sighs> record for the digital currency. A trillion dollars in market cap now. You know who we're going to ask about that? Dave Wilson? Paul Krugman. Oh, yeah. Paul Krugman, of Nobel course. Nobel laureate. He's written about it. He's not a fan. And Dave Wilson, too. And Dave Wilson. All right, we've got lots to get through uh, over the next few hours. Let's get you going, though, on this Friday with a check on the trading day. Here is Charlie Bellin. Thank you very much. Let's begin with Bitcoin now looking at a $55,000 handle on Bitcoin, up 6.6% today. Right now, Bitcoin is at $55,400. S&P 500 index up two points now. That's a gain of less than one-tenth of one percent. We'll give you the numbers and the why in just a moment here. The Dow's up. 65 up two tenths of one percent. NASDAQ up 22 again there of two tenths. Ten year yield looking at 1.34 percent right now on the 10 year. Gold up three tenths of one percent, 1780 the ounce. And uh, West Texas Intermediate crude down 1.6 percent, 59.56 a barrel. Texas Power Grid is returning to normal operations as that historic cold blast eases. Natural gas now up eight tenths of one percent, 310 per million BTUs. Stock Stocks uh, pairing gains still higher across the board as benchmark treasury yields climb to the highest in a year. Renewing concern, rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. So again, repeating, Bitcoin now at 55,615, S&P up two, a gain of one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That, my friends, is a Bloomberg Business Flash. You could buy a car with it or put a down payment on a house, Charlie. If I knew how to use it, <laughs> knew how to knew someone who could actually uh, do the transaction, not a bad idea. All right, we'll keep that in mind. Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. Now let's get to the Market Drivers Report with Dave Wilson. got a market that uh, is in search of direction and really has been all day and arguably for much of the past two weeks. So 
you know, on the one side, you've got the industrial stocks leading the way among the 11 main groups in the S&P 500. And a big piece of that is Deere. Uh, shares are up 10 a half percent after uh, earnings and sales came out way ahead of analyst average estimates in Bloomberg survey for the third straight quarter. Plus, they raised their full year profit projection by a billion dollars. That works out to 26 percent if you take so the midpoint of their ranges. And on the other side, well, you see utilities, you see communication services, and that's Facebook and Google's owner Alphabet and the like. So, you know, definitely a, a, a split in the market. And, you know, it's a matter of how things unfold from here. I mean, given that we're really through the bulk of uh, fourth quarter earnings at this point, you know, Deere's results actually for their fiscal first quarter, but definitely well received. That was a big move. And maybe says something too, Dave, about where we're going or where we are going in terms of the economy. It might well be. I mean, you have to kind of take a step back and say there are a few things, if you look specifically at Deere, that are in its favor. One is that you're seeing uh, crop prices go up, and that means farmers have more money to spend on equipment. Another thing is, you know, we're spending more time at home, and that means we're buying all sorts of uh, products that are going to make things easier, make our homes look better. And, you know, you think about deer lawnmowers or whatever, that certainly fits the category. And they also have construction and forestry businesses. And, you know, you think about infrastructure spending coming down the line. You think about lumber prices setting a record. There are a lot of things going deer's way at this point. Hey, Dave, what's the story playing out in the, in the bond market right now? Um, we're seeing Treasury yields climbing to the highest levels in a year. Uh, what's the story there? Well, it just comes back to sort of what you're seeing on the stock side when you look not only at the industrial shares, but the commodity producers, energy and materials. It's all about the thought that reflation is coming, that uh, you know the economy is going to pick up, prices will rise along with that. And, of course, that means higher bond yields, and that translates into lower prices. So, you know, when you look at, uh, say, the 10-year uh, uh, Treasury uh, being down about a half a point, uh, you know, that's the sort of move uh, that, that certainly fits that theme. Are you surprised that you're not seeing more of a pullback in stocks, given that we are seeing this movement in the bond market? Not especially, because... You know, I mean, some of the analyst commentary I've seen, sort of a reminder that, you know, stocks can do well when interest rates are starting to go up. I mean, they get to a certain point, and, you know, the competition between stocks and bonds uh, can certainly swing in the other direction. Uh, you, you know, you look at the 10-year uh, Treasury, and the yield is about 1.34%. And then you look at the dividend yield on the S&P 500, and you know, it's at 1.48%. So you've still got that working in favor of stocks. Now, if you get to 1.5% or higher on the 10-year Treasury, maybe that changes the equation. I don't know. But at the very least, uh, for the moment, you, you sort of have some things working in favor of stocks. They really have been for some time now. Got to say, I had a little computer problem here, so forgive me. I'm here. I'm alive and kicking. Hey, Dave Wilson, we're going to talk, uh, Tim and I are going to talk with Paul Krugman later on, and he's got some very strong thoughts, as you know, when it comes to the economy, political policies, um, but I do want to talk to him about the $1.9 trillion plan that Biden, uh, President Biden and his team think we need for this economy. He's a fan of it and, and is a backer of it. How much of the financial markets, the equity markets, are just kind of banking on some kind of massive stimulus again? Well, it, no doubt it's part of the mix at this point, just because there is so much anticipation it's going to go through uh, in some form. I mean, I saw one number, I can't remember which firm was off the hand, suggesting it might end up being $1.5 trillion mm -hmm. as opposed to $1.9 trillion. There Still a lot, be, right? Absolutely. There, you know, there's some kind of compromise for sure, but you know, a whole lot of money to uh, pump into the economy. And, you know, arguably the effects have been playing out in stocks lately, so uh, we'll be watching for more. That. Okay, so taking a step back and thinking about earnings season as it gets wrapped up here, Dave, what's the message that we've, we've heard from CFOs, from management about how they're thinking about the economy, how they're thinking about the recovery? Well, the message in short is you know, look for things to get better from here. And, you know, investors have been especially tough on companies that haven't been providing that sort of guidance, whether, you know, the, remember my stock of the day from yesterday, Stamps.com, coming in and say anything about its outlook <laughs> for this year, and the shares yeah. got pounded. Yeah. And in other cases, you know, companies not quite as optimistic as analysts were anticipating, and you see declines there, too. So, 
you know, sure, things are getting better, uh, you know, if you pay attention to what the uh, companies are saying, but, you know, investors are looking for Got a it. lot. All right, Dave, thank you so much. Dave will be with us a little bit later, Ron. Uh, coming up, though, over the next three hours, get ready for the vaccine surge. A great story by our Drew Armstrong, so we'll dig into that. It really feels like we're turning a corner now here Does. when it comes to the pandemic. We're seeing good numbers around the country, Carol. Fingers and crossed. Fingers crossed. And Toes we're also crossed. seeing some good vaccine news. Yeah, exactly. Um, speaking of getting a COVID vaccine, Nobel laureate Paul Krugman, he got a second one. He tweeted about it. He did. I'm excited to speak to him all about his new, well, his book that's now out in paperback. Um, and really curious to hear from him about his thoughts on the stimulus. Yeah. Like what you were talking about with Dave. And kind of where we are in terms of the economy and also his thoughts, thoughts on things like, like you said, on digital currencies. Uh, we're going to have the president and CEO of the American Gas Association. I really just kind of want to say, what happened? Yeah. Busy week for her. Yeah, totally. So we'll get into that. Uh, Apple taking another step forward to making a car, question mark, question mark. This was a big one, an exclusive <laughs> by our Bloomberg News team. Uh, caused a lot of stocks to move. Yeah, exactly. So watching that. And then we're going to talk about uh, talking of taking steps, uh, the Biden administration, President Biden specifically, really taking, I feel like, a big step forward when it comes to international policy and kind of working together again with allies. Yeah, so much of the focus has been over the past few months, and especially at the beginning of the Biden presidency, on the pandemic, on domestic issues, on the administration of vaccine. It does feel like that foreign relations have kind of taken a backseat to a tr time period where traditionally there would be a lot of news about a, a, a new U.S. president reaching out to allies. Right, exactly. Exactly. So we'll dig into that. Um, let's do the Bloomberg Business Week bite of the day. One number that tells us a lot. Today's number, 16. Tesla fell in Consumer Reports' latest auto brand rankings, outdone by Mazda's mainstream models. The electric car maker dropped five spots from last year's report to rank number 16, the middle of the pack in the closely watched annual assessment based on road tests, reliability data, owner satisfaction surveys, and safety performance. All right, good to know. Let's get to roll the national news over to Nancy Lyons. Hey, Nance. Hey, Carol. President Biden is touring a Pfizer plant this afternoon in Michigan as his administration boosts the number of COVID-19 shots administered every day. The U.S. has given about 1.67 million shots a day over the past week, according to the Bloomberg vaccine tracker. That's up from an average of roughly 900,000 a day in the week before Biden took office. Earlier today, Biden also committed the U.S. to providing $2 billion to GoFax which aims to help lower-income countries with vaccines. Well, Biden gave his first international speech today and emphasized the importance of democracy and the need for nations to pull together to solve the world's problems. I know the past few years have strained and tested our transatlantic relationship, but the United States is determined, determined to re-engage with Europe, to consult with you, Earn back our position of trusted leadership. He spoke before the Munich Security Conference. Buckingham Palace has confirmed Prince Harry and his wife Meghan will not be returning to royal duties, and Harry will give up his honorary military titles. Royal historian Alastair Bruce says Prince Han Harry had been a brilliant military officer, so that decision will likely sting. It must be agony for him that because of the choice that he has rightly made in support of his wife, family, and their future, it is no longer compatible with that sort of more selfless expectation that any member of the royal family needs to offer the Queen if they're going to be part of the working royal family. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. All right, Nance, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, along with Tim Stenovic in our interactive broker studio. Yep, it's a Friday. Uh, so <laughs> where do you want to go? You want to talk real estate? Yeah, let's talk real estate. All right, let's do it, because the Federal Reserve warning of significant risks of business bankruptcies and steep drops in commercial real estate prices. They put out a report today, and here's what they said. It's a semi-annual monetary policy report to Congress, and here's the quote. Business leverage now stands near historical highs, insolvency risks at small and medium-sized firms, as well as at some large firms, remain considerable. Now, in part encouraged by government and Fed programs, businesses have taken on more debt over the past year as they've struggled to deal with the economic and financial fallout from COVID-19, including in some cases, of course, forced shutdowns. Now, there is a slew of real estate news today. Yeah. Um, it could be rock bottom for New York real estate. Uh, not now, but a long way off, Carol. Yeah, exactly. Uh, rents in Manhattan, Brooklyn had the steepest year-over-year -year drop on record in January. That's a new report out from Street Easy. 
Um, but we are seeing sales activity soaring, uh, also according to a new report. But unsold inventory, especially in the luxury tier, continues to push prices down. Listen, I think time will tell, and I think it might take, especially if, <laughs> if there are people who moved out um, or took advantage maybe of a, a lower mortgage or rent, maybe even in the city. Like, I just think it, there, it's going to take a while for it to kind of get back to where it was. Yeah. And, if it and gets back there. Yeah, that's the big question. I, I, look, I think it will. Um, it, I think it's going to take time. But walking in Manhattan right now, you see so many stores that are closed. It's discouraging. It really is. And and one of the um, one of the really sort of like archetypes of that is is the vacancy uh, at, at in, in the Midtown market, mm -hmm. which is Tiffany. Uh, it's, a, it's a vacancy looms for Trump in weak Midtown Manhattan market. At a time when Midtown Manhattan is struggling with empty storefronts and a plunge in luxury shoppers, the Trump organization facing the prospect of having to fill retail space uh, just off of Fifth Avenue. Right. Tiffany's going through a major renovation. They shifted their spot. They're going to go back to their traditional spot on Fifth Avenue, but then that space that they leave is going to be up for rent. So, yeah, there's so much going on when it comes to real estate. This is Bloomberg Radio.
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. World headquarters. I'm Charlie Pellet. The Dow, the S&P, Nasdaq, all higher right now. Stocks of paired gains, though, as benchmark Treasury yields climb to the highest level in a year, renewing concern, rising borrowing costs, and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. Right now, the 10-year yield 1.34 percent. The S&P is up two points, up less than one tenth of one percent. Little change to the Dow, higher by 71, up two tenths of one percent. Nasdaq back on the plus side now. Up 32 points, higher by two-tenths of one percent at 13,898. Gold is up $5 a ounce, up three-tenths of one percent, 1781 right now. West Texas intermediate crude down 1.6 percent, 59.58 a barrel. Natural gas up two-tenths of one percent. Nat gas now at 308 per million BTUs. Recapping, stocks higher across the board cannot ignore Bitcoin today. Now trading at 55,182. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie. Thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. We've done a reset. We're in a good place. Carol we are. Nasser, along with Tim Stenevik. <laughs> and I got to say, this feels, Tim, like a really good headline that a U.S. vaccine surge is coming. Yeah, it does. Uh, Drew Armstrong and Tom Randall wrote about this, and it it's gotten a lot of attention because right now the U.S. is administering 1.6 million doses a day, and it's been constrained by supply, but mm -hmm. that could soon change. Yeah, let's bring in Drew to talk about it. He's Bloomberg News, U.S. Senior Editor for U.S. Healthcare uh, here at Bloomberg, and he joins us on the phone in New York City. Hey, Drew, good to have you here with us. So it feels like a good headline, is it? Yes. I mean, uh, you know, like I, I've, been, uh, I've been trained by the last year to be a bit of a pessimist, but I have to say <laughs> when stuff could go wrong, it has gone wrong. Um, and I, I, we approached this story with a good deal of skepticism, I will say. Um, you know, but what we what we're saying here is we took a very close look at what the companies that are manufacturing vaccine have promised about their contractual obligations uh, obligations to deliver vaccine that they have said that they will meet, and then some additional um, delivery timelines uh, that have been broken out by them. Basically, did the math and said. You know, if they keep the promises that they have said that they are going to keep, we are in for a major boost in uh, vaccine doses that are available in this country. And, and, and frankly, they have, you know, almost more than I think we, you know, we may need by July if everything goes well. OK, if everything goes well, a key caveat there, right? Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, uh, when we looked at when we ran the numbers right now, the U.S. is distributing somewhere between, you know, in recent weeks, 10 to 15 million doses a week. Um, by the time we get to March, we're looking at 25 million a week in April and May, sorry, 20 million a week in March, 25 million a week in April and May and 30 million a week in June. All of that depends on these manufac vaccine manufacturers you know, not having some major unforeseen uh, you know, manufacturing issue, there not being some unforeseen significant side effect, um, you know, distribution, bottlenecks, all of those things. There's plenty of stuff that can still go wrong. This is a model that is not a guarantee. But, you know, from what we've seen, and these are conservative companies that tend not to promise things that they don't think that they can deliver, this is good news. Did you say side effect? Yeah, I, listen, you know, these vaccines have been approved under an emergency use authorization. They've been approved, they've been cleared for use, I should say, you know, on a limited period of safety observation. And, you know, the reason that it is approved under an emergency use authorization is because you don't have the usual six months to follow up that you would like to have. So, you know, you never know is, is something going to emerge later on that we don't know about now. Right now, that doesn't appear to be the case from all of the data we follow. But I think, you know, with anything like this, the point of these EUA um, authorization is to keep an open mind for that possibility and be ready for it and watching for it. I got to ask you, so if we're going to have vaccines from Moderna, from Pfizer, from J&J, &J, would you take, would you be okay taking any of them? You know, I, I think the advice that has been given by anybody who is a, a professional in this field is, you know, if you get, if someone offers you a vaccine right now, take it. Um, but you know what I'm saying, know, that in terms of the efficacy and so on. 
I, I think if you look at the efficacy, you know, you see the 95% numbers for Pfizer and Moderna. Keep in mind that those were tested in an environment where we did not have any of these new variants. J&J was tested in a more variant-rich environment, which probably degrades the efficacy of some of the of their vaccines slightly. You know, these are not perfect apples-to-apples apples comparison. You know, the J&J shot has other advantages. It's a one-dose vaccine, um, which is certainly something that, you know, gets you closer to immunity uh, you know, you complete that series much sooner. You complete it as soon as you have gotten the gotten the shot. A couple of weeks later, probably have some immunity built up. So, you know, I, I think we're we're in a world right now where if someone came to my house and said, "Hey, are you ready to be vaccinated?" I wouldn't be particularly picky about which one I was getting. Yeah, and hopefully you'd call me and tell me to get over there and get a vaccine too. <laughs> I would appreciate that, Drew. Um, hey, Drew. So these numbers are, are looking very good from from a supply perspective. But I'm wondering if the U.S. has the infrastructure right now. Do we have enough people to actually administer this many shots? Do we have enough syringes? Do we have enough needles? Uh, do we have enough freezers to store them? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we have seen on the ground and it made us a little more confident in writing this story was that in addition to the supply really beginning to pick up in the coming weeks and months, you have seen a lot of noises coming out of the states and from the federal government that if you piece them together, really amount to a significant expansion of the, you know, boots on the ground administration pipeline, the capacity to get doses into arms. Um, you know, San Francisco, they opened up the football stadium and said they can do 15,000 doses a day. In Delaware, FEMA is setting up a pop-up vaccination site that will do 3,000 doses a day for six weeks. And there's not that many people in Delaware, so you don't need a permanent thing of that size. Um, New York uh, City has said they could do half a million doses a week, I believe, if they had sufficient supply. Michigan, earlier this month, they testified before Congress. They said, we could do 80,000 doses a day if you, had, if, we, if you guys gave us enough vaccine. By our numbers, they tend to, they have peaked out around 50,000 doses a day. It's been lower than that recently because of uh, storms and, and presumably some supply disruptions because of those storms. So there is a lot of capacity out there in the country to get shots into arms. We have been supply constrained for the last weeks. If I look at the number of vaccines that are being delivered out there into the country, it's enough to basically do around, you know, a million and a half or maybe a little bit more doses a day. And that's exactly where our administration numbers are right now. So hey, we're in a supply ceiling world. Drew, just really quickly, 15 seconds here. So based on your projections or Bloomberg projections by end of summer, we're all vaccinated if we want it. If people will get the vaccine, which is a whole other bigger question. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're well, going to have to have you back to uh, talk about that, Drew. We know we will, right? Drew Armstrong, Senior Editor for U.S. Healthcare at Bloomberg News, on the phone in New York City. Check him out on Twitter at Armstrong Drew and check him out at Bloomberg.com as well. This is Bloomberg Radio.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. All right, you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, along with Tim Stenovic. Uh, President Biden giving a speech, uh, really his first speech to an international G7 audience, uh, talking about NATO, talking about China, talking about choosing democracy over autocracy. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that. We are so much focused in recent months has been on the coronavirus pandemic, domestic mm -hmm. issues, getting the U.S. out of this crisis that I think a little bit has been lost when it comes to um, just thinking about the foreign policy agenda of the Biden administration. So this will be good to dig into. Yeah, exactly. The role of the U.S., right, in the in the world. All right. Uh, first up, though, let's get back to Charlie Pellet. Check on the trading day. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, indeed. Right now, trading mixed, but I'm keeping an eye on earnings. Uh, Deere and Company up now by 10.1 percent. Also, after earnings, Applied Materials up now by 5.4. Mixed day, as I mentioned, the S&P lower now has been swinging between gains and losses. It's been that kind of a day. The Dow, though, moving higher, up 23 points. Potentially could see an up week for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. S&P, NASDAQ, both on track for a losing week here. NASDAQ, little changed up now by just one point. Ten-year yield, 1.34%. Stocks pairing gains as Treasury yields climb to the highest in a year. Renewing concern, rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. Recovery. Gold up two tenths of one percent, seventeen seventy nine the ounce. Sam West Texas Intermediate crude trading lower now by two point four percent, fifty nine oh eight a barrel. Natural gas down six tenths of one percent, three oh six per million BTUs. Efforts to hasten vaccination programs are showing a progress. Seventy nine percent of doses distributed have been used, according to Bloomberg's vaccine tracker. A significant improvement from the early days of the rollout in December and January. Dr. Andrew Pekosh is a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. The real tipping point, modelers can say, is around 70% of the adult population being immunized. At that point in time, we should be seeing very substantial effects of vaccination on virus spread. But again, don't get me wrong, we'll see effects before then. So rolling out the vaccine as soon as possible is always going to help us. But 70% is that tipping point that I've seen most modelers point at. Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Among some of the vaccine names that we do track, Pfizer down two-tenths of one percent, BioNTech up 2.7 percent, AstraZeneca down 1.7 percent, Moderna, which reports earnings next week, up 2.6 percent, Johnson & Johnson lower today by 1.2 percent. Recapping equities mixed, S&P down six points, a drop of one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie. Thank you so much. Appreciate the update. So President Biden delivering his first international speech, a pair of uh, international conferences today, and addressing the group of seven. Yeah, that's right. The the president urging U.S. allies to uphold democracy in his first major speech to an international audience, warning that the world faces a, quote, inflection point in history. Yeah, really interesting. And uh, uh, we definitely, you know, covered that earlier. Justin Sink is White House reporter at Bloomberg News. He's been following this as well. He's on the phone in Washington. Hey, Justin, nice to have you here with Tim and myself. So what stood out for you in terms of what President Biden said addressing that international audience? Hey guys, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I think there were two kind of interesting things happening. One was the president trying to sort of uh, corral uh, multilateral action on a number of the pressing problems that his administration has identified. So on the pandemic itself, trying to get additional contributions from Europe to uh, a World Health Organization program that, that will uh, give vaccine doses to poor countries in the world. On climate change, today is the day that the U.S. is officially back in the Paris Climate Accord. And so uh, we heard him talk about uh, how in, in a departure from the Trump administration, the U.S. is going to sort of re-engage with the rest of the world on climate change issues. And then uh, another treaty that, or, or another agreement that the Trump administration pulled out from the Iran nuclear deal, that was something that, that we heard from the State Department last night that the U.S. is ready to re-enter talks on. 
uh, start political conversation. So I think uh, the real takeaway to, for me from from today's speech was Biden saying, "Hey, we're we pivoting back from the Trump administration. Uh, we're looking to reengage allies." Where where President Trump uh, had said, you know, kind of looked more transactionally at, at these alliances and said, "Well, we're not sure that they're they're benefiting us in the way that." They could. Uh, we can strike stronger trade deals. We can get more concessions on defense if we don't sort of pay deference to, tra- to traditional alliances. And so you just see the the sort of 180 in terms of approach here that, that was sketched out in the president's speech. Today. Well, I'm glad you described it as a as a 180 because that's that's exactly my question. Given that we saw such a sharp shift under the Trump administration when it comes to foreign policy, as to what we saw under the uh, Obama administration, and now back to something more similar with the Biden administration, is there any risk to to allies right now? that they're going to say, hey, wait a second, what happens four years from now if there's a Republican administration and we have to start all of this over again, right? Like it's it's this, you know, kind of game of ping pong type of thing. Yeah, and I think it makes it much harder for the Biden administration to pursue the type of deals like the climate deal or like the Iran deal that you saw them negotiate under the Obama administration. You remember at the end of the Obama years, uh, as as Trump was sort of gaining politically, the, the president was said, telling allies, you know, don't worry about him. He's not going to win. You're going to have Hillary Clinton as president. And and that didn't turn out to be true. And there were sort of huge ramifications for it. Uh, on the other side, though, there are elements of, of Trump's foreign policy that, that I think Europeans are looking at and saying, well, Joe Biden's going to continue this, uh, whether, you know, it's the tariffs against China that the administration still hasn't pulled back, whether it's plans to kind of pull troops out of uh, the Middle East, Afghanistan specifically. We haven't seen a a big departure, and those are areas of concern for European allies. So the president both has to sell that that he is um, turning things around, both because, uh, you know, they've seen these wild variations and because, you know, there are some policies that that he's holding on to. Yeah, China, right? He, we must prepare together for a long-term strategic competition with China. So really seem to be reaching out to allies, Justin, and saying, listen, we got to work together on this one. And, and that's a real sticking point. I mean, before, you know, in, in I think early January, before the president got into office, there was a big economic re- agreement signed between the EU and China. And that was mm-hmm. despite uh, Jake Sullivan, the, the president's, President Biden's national security advisor, asking them to hold off. There's been tension around this G7 meeting, both the, the preliminary one today and, and the upcoming one um, later this summer in the UK, where uh, Boris Johnson, who uh, was aligned with President Trump and, and taken a sort of anti-China policy, has been trying to recruit other countries to participate in the G7. But there's worry among Japanese and European diplomats that, that this could alienate Beijing, and, and that's mm-hmm. not something that they necessarily want to do. So threading the needle there is going to be really tough for for President Biden. Yeah, it's going to be tricky. All right, Justin, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Justin Sink, White House reporter at Bloomberg News, joining us on the phone from Washington, D.C. Let's uh, stay there, check in with Nancy Lyons for World of National News. Hey, Nance. Hey, Carol. The Biden administration is playing catch-up on vaccinations following severe winter weather that hampered delivery of shipments. COVID-19 Task Force Advisor Andy Slavitt announced that all 50 states have been affected by delayed shipments, with Six million doses stuck in warehouses. UPS and FedEx both will support Saturday deliveries tomorrow. We are working with the jurisdictions to see which ones are able to take Saturday delivery. Slavitt says all the backlog doses should be delivered in the next several days. Well, with the Biden administration ramping up vaccines, some are asking if one dose is enough, and a new study is adding some fuel to that debate. The study of Israeli health workers found the first dose of the two-shot Pfizer vaccine reduced COVID infections by 85 percent. Dr. Stuart Ray with the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine is taking this with caution. We know from some of the studies that the antibody responses will wane fairly quickly after just one dose. The second dose not only boosts those responses, but also solidifies them. Dr. Ray also says less than complete protection could lead to more coronavirus variants. He says incomplete suppression is what's driving 
driving the rise of new strains. In Washington, I'm Nathan Hager, Bloomberg Radio. While well, those states slammed by winter storms that left millions without power for days have now traded one crisis for another. Power is coming back, but broken water pipes brought on by record low temps have created a shortage of clean drinking water, have shut down airports and left hospitals scrambling. Seven million people in Texas have been ordered to boil their water before consuming it. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Thank you so much, Nancy. Carol Master, along with Tim Stenovic in our Interactive Brokers studio. So this is kind of interesting against a story we talked about earlier in the week. The story that's on the terminal right now is Uber Technologies losing a UK Supreme Court ruling over the rights of its drivers. It's a landmark decision that strikes a blow against the gig economy. Essentially, Tim, the judge unanimously ruling that Uber drivers are quote-unquote workers entitled to rights such as minimum wages, holiday pay, and rest breaks. And uh, Uber shares, they fell a bit lower on the news. Hey, if this sounds familiar to you, it's because this has been an issue in many parts of the world with the rise of the gig economy. Think California and Proposition 22 getting so much attention ahead of the November election. And the consequences, it makes sense because the consequences of a ruling like this are huge for a company like Uber. Uber and other gig, so-called gig economy companies, they don't want to treat workers as, as workers because it costs so much more money to give them the benefits that come with being an employee. They would much rather have them be contractors and right. have them, uh, you know, uh, make their own hours. And It's a whole uh, different cost it's structure, right? It's a completely different cost structure. Well, but it's interesting, too, how it's unfolding, California or what UK is, right, like around the world. And I do wonder, ultimately, who wins out in terms of thinking, or do we have different policies around the globe? You know, and so often... different approaches. And so often we, we, we think about a company like Uber or Lyft when it comes to the, to the gig economy, but just look at what Amazon is trying to do with its last-mile deliveries, right? Mm -hmm. Amazon essentially saying, hey, we would like you to come work as an independent contractor to deliver packages, so it's it's not just Uber, it's not just Amazon, right? And it's I think even helping Lyft. those individuals kind of set up, right, exactly. in terms of set up shots, because so, it's cheaper for them to help someone start a business that's their own business than give them full time employment, right? All that overhead is recurring costs. Like I am curious how this ultimately, like two years from now, three years from now, ultimately. What is the gig economy and how it's being treated? Are they kind of normal workers? Yeah, if you're interested in this, go check out Josh Idelson's story. We talked to him story. earlier this week. It's in Bloomberg Business Week. It's called The Gig Economy is Coming for Millions of American Jobs. Coming up next, we're going to talk about Apple and talks to buy self-driving sensors. They're moving forward. This is Bloomberg.
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. It is a mixed Friday. Benchmark Treasury yields climbing to the highest levels in a year, renewing concern that rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. The 10-year yield right now, 1.34%. Stocks mixed, S&P lower by three, down one-tenth of one percent. The Dow higher, up one-tenth of one percent right now. The Dow up 27 points. NASDAQ up seven. Little change now, up by less than one-tenth of one percent. Oil is declining as U.S. production begins to come back online. West Texas Intermediate Crude tumbling two and a half percent right now, 58.99 a barrel. And natural gas down five-tenths of one percent at uh, 306 per million BTUs. So again, recapping here, stocks mixed, S&P down four, a drop of one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you, Charlie Pellet. February is Black History Month, and throughout the month, Bloomberg Radio is celebrating pivotal moments in U.S. black history. Here with more is Bloomberg's Renita Young. On this day in black history in 2002, Vanetta Flowers becomes the first black woman to win a gold medal in the Winter Olympic Games. She and her partner Jill Bracken won the inaugural women's two-person bobsled event, which was the first medal for a U.S. bobsled team in 46 years. But bobsledding was only one of the sports Flowers mastered. She participated in track and field, volleyball, and basketball in high school, and she accepted a track and field scholarship to the University of Alabama at Birmingham, becoming one of the university's most decorated athletes. Flowers' track and field background was a huge advantage in bobsled, and she quickly became the number one break woman in the United States. So in May of 2011, Flowers was inducted into the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame. That's Today in Black History. I'm Renita Young, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Renita, thank you so much. So, Tim, among our most read stories on the Bloomberg, you actually mentioned this on our call, our planning call. And this is about Apple in discussions with multiple suppliers of self-driving car sensors. They're known as LiDAR, according to those in the know. Yeah, look, this is a really big deal. It was such a big deal, yes. in fact, that we kind of threw out the entire top of our show when we knew that Ed was about to publish this story. And we had Ed be the lead to talk about um, this development when it comes to Apple and self-driving cars. So let's bring him in. Ed Ludlow follows the auto uh, area for us here at Bloomberg News, among other things. He joins us uh, on the phone, actually from our Bloomberg 960 studio in San Francisco. Hey, Ed. So Hello. Hello. So what is Apple up to? Yeah, so according to sources, Apple is talking to a number of sensor makers, you know, principally focused on LiDAR. And, and it's important because, you know, there's been a lot of reporting recently around Apple's car project and them working towards a self-driving car. And, and the general consensus, the wisdom across the automotive and, and AI industries is that LiDAR is just such a core part of what will enable cars to drive themselves. You know, it's a laser sensor that can give the, the sort of most accurate and richest digital picture of the world around the car. You know, there's different approaches, different automakers, different startups use a different blend of sensors. Some are very LiDAR heavy, some are very camera and radar heavy. And Apple's put a lot of work into developing their own. But the fact that they're even talking to suppliers shows they've got a little way to go on their self-driving car prospects. And also, it's kind of admission that, you know, they're looking to the, the, the companies that are expert in this field. So, Ed, you mentioned that different companies have different approaches when it comes to autonomous driving, self-driving. Um, Tesla does not use LiDAR, right? Yeah, so Tesla's consumer cars, of which you can see on public roads all around the world, have a camera-heavy system, a series of cameras around the outside of the vehicle. And that is how the Tesla car detects and interprets the world around it. There's a lot more than that goes into that when it comes to self-driving, right? And, and a, a big part of it is the software, the artificial intelligence, the, the semiconductors, the system integration. But Tesla is at odds with the rest of the industry. And it kind of sets us up for a nice debate. It's one reason why Wall Street analysts, market commentators are so interested in Apple's entry into a, the car market. Because Apple has some very clear competency in software. 
you know, our smartphones, our iPhones are very smart, something we take for granted. And if it's able to get its act together along with the billions and billions of dollars of cash it's got in the bank, then it, it could on paper be a very serious player in a world of self-driving cars eventually. But as we've reported previously and based on today's story, you, you know, the, the feeling is that Apple is many years away from that car being ready. Hmm. But they've also, you know, come out in the past, we're working on a car, then backed off of it. Yes. Is there something different, Ed, this time around? So in 2019, Apple kind of reset its car program. You know, we reported in the last couple of weeks that Apple had held talks with automakers, including that Apple had held talks with automakers, including Hyundai and Kia. In those, in that case specifically of those two names, those talks were on hold. It's talking with other automakers. It's invested heavily, as I said, on the software side. It has a lot of talent working internally on this. But I think I've said this line to you dozens of times, Carol. (laughs) Building prototypes is very easy. Getting a very complicated electric and self-driving vehicle that can be mass-produced is very hard. And and our latest reporting and the sources we're speaking to basically say Apple is still very much in R&D phase, and it's working out how this vehicle eventually gets built. It looks like it will outsource to an automotive partner. Remember, the iPhone is assembled not by Apple, but by Foxconn. Good point. Um, And... You know, all of the signs tell us that the approach that Apple takes, whatever it, whenever this happens, whatever happens, it will be very similar. That that Apple kind of comes up with the brains and the design of the beast, but it's actually manufactured by those that can do it best, car makers. Look, Tesla may be in a good place right now, but if you are thinking about how difficult it is to do this, look no further than, you know, Tesla's last decade, which has been very bumpy to get where it is right now. Hey, Ed, what's the deal with the robo-taxi technology that that Apple has been testing uh, on roads in California for a few years? Yeah, and this comes back to the whole LiDAR question. That it's all Our reporting suggests Apple hasn't even settled on a LiDAR yet. And if you compare Apple's testing here in California to the likes of Cruise, which is owned by General Motors, or Wayne owned by Google, those guys are very far ahead in their testing compared to Apple. It's a measurement of miles per disengagement. In other words, how many miles can their test vehicles drive before a human has to intervene or before the system shuts down because it doesn't think it's safe? Apple is making progress, but on that metric, which has flaws, it's not a perfect metric, but it's the only one we've got, Apple is not able to drive as many miles before a disengagement as Cruise and Waymo are. And, and and the whole point going back to LiDAR is that Cruise and Waymo have a sensor suite. They have software. They have a system that they are testing and constantly building on. But based on the reporting that we've done, Apple's not quite there with its system. It doesn't know what its best sensor is. It doesn't know what its best blend of LiDAR is. And it has a lot more testing to do, which gives us some sense of how far away they really are. It's interesting, too. And let's remind everybody, right, that they weren't first out to market with a cell phone, and yet look at where they are. (laughs) It's an innovation story, right? No one doubts Apple's competency in those areas of software, and I don't think anyone doubts their bank account either and their command of the global supply chain. And and if you read Wall Street Notes, that's why we take this seriously. So, Ed, what is an Apple... Apple developed car look like? How much does it cost? What is uh, uh, the final product? A lot of this is hypothesis from the part of, of pundits, market commentators. You know, the, the reporting that we've done basically says that it is a luxury product, that that the autonomy and self-driving part is the differentiator. You know, the speculation is that this won't be a normal car that you park in your driveway. But that is what Apple does, right? All we can go on is what Apple does, and that is sell to the middle and upper classes here in the United States and China with a luxury high-end product. Mm. And, and you know, my take, my read on what I'm hearing is that the car would reflect that. Don't park it in your driveway. Okay, now I'm <laughs> curious. Is it hovering <laughs> above well, my you, house? Well, you know, maybe oh. like as part of a fleet, maybe oh, it's a okay. shared car, maybe as part of a community, who knows? But yeah. that's something that Tesla's talked about as well, right? The robo-taxi fleet. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm happy parking my, my little SUV in the garage for now. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Ed, congratulations. Uh, nice scoop. Ed Ludlow and the team, auto reporter at Bloomberg News uh, from San Francisco. For those of you lo- listening in New York, D.C., and San Francisco watching on YouTube, Business Week continues. If you're listening on Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, Bay State Business next.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. World headquarters. I'm Charlie Pettit. We move into the final hour of trading on this Friday, February 19th, on track for a losing week for the S&P 500 index. Mixed picture for U.S. equities right now, right to the numbers. We'll give you the details in a moment. S&P down two. That is a drop of about one-tenth of one percent. Dow Jones Industrial Average up 37 now, higher by one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ up 26, higher by about two-tenths of one percent. Benchmark Treasury yields are at the highest in a year, renewing concern that rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. Ten-year yield 1.34% after snapping the longest losing streak since December. The S&P 500 index went from positive to negative. Gold is up three-tenths of one percent right now, 17.80 the ounce, higher by just about $4.80 the ounce. West Texas intermediate crude declining down 2.5%, 58.98 a barrel right now. Oil moving lower as U.S. production begins to come back online. And we have got natural gas down uh, five tenths of one percent. Natural gas 306 now per million BTUs. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers is warning that the Fed will likely be pressured into raising rates sooner than markets expect. He made the remark in an interview with Bloomberg's David Weston. I'd expect rate hikes to be underway by the end, well underway by the end of 2022. Will its hands be forced essentially by inflation? I think a combination of inflation and perhaps an overheating economy and uh, fiscal policy on fire, particularly if we actually uh, build back better. And look, returning to more normal interest rates could be okay, but it's going to be a very challenging transition. And you can catch the full interview tonight, 6 p.m. Wall Street time, Wall Street Week on Bloomberg Radio. Recapping S&P down two, down one-tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. So we'll get right to our next guest, Paul Krugman. He is back with us, Nobel laureate, economist, New York Times columnist, City University of New York, distinguished professor of economics. He's author of many, many books. And his latest book, now out in paper book, Arguing with Zombies, Economics, Politics, and the Fight for a Better Future. He is joining us on the phone in Princeton, New Jersey. And he also, by the way, tweeted out that he just got his second vaccine, COVID vaccine today. Uh, Paul, it is great to have you here back on on Bloomberg. How are you? Uh, I'm a little weary. I think a, a little bit of the second day effect of the of the vaccine, but I'm fine. Okay, so you are feeling a little bit. We've heard that from a fair amount of people, so you do feel a little yeah. something. Yeah, it, it, it's fine. It, uh, the water is fine. Uh, jump in. At <laughs> we're, we're, I'm ready. We're ready and eager. <laughs> so, yeah. Paul, let's talk about kind of uh, this world where we are. We, we're going to talk about your book in a moment, but I do want to ask you, when you look at the U.S. economy, the impact of COVID, there are some economic reports that do feel like things are certainly getting better. Labor market's still tough. How do you see the U.S. economy? I think we still have another six months of rough times because it is very hard to do normal business when people are rightfully still afraid of, 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 of COVID. And so we're going to be a pandemic depressed economy uh, for well past the middle of this year. But I'm actually, I'm quite optimistic about after that. I think we are, we don't have the same kind of uh, overhang of excessive debts and so on that we had after the last crisis. We are apparently on the verge of getting an adequate uh, economic relief package. So I think we're going to have a probably going to be feeling pretty optimistic by this time next year. Well, that's some, that's some that's some good news. Um, what about when it comes to the labor market specifically? How do we get millions of Americans who lost their job during this pandemic back to work? I think that's going to be a lot easier than people imagine. Uh, the The job losses are concentrated. Uh, there are a lot of it's not all there, but a lot of the job losses are concentrated in sectors that are basically shut down because of pandemic risks. And once we have widespread vaccination, you know, this is all assuming that the variants don't get ahead of us and, and we lose control of the pandemic again. But once we have 
widespread vaccination, effective herd immunity, people will start eating in restaurants again. People will start to travel again. There'll be some dislocations because we won't go back to exactly the same economy we had before. But, you know, after the after the last crisis, there were many people who were saying, oh, just those jobs are not coming back. Workers don't have the right skills. And they were totally wrong. It turned out that we were quite capable of getting back to full employment. And there's no reason to think that isn't true again. Do you think that when we get on the other side of this, that we do, you, you're optimistic, obviously, as you said, that we do have potentially a run in the economy, a run perhaps in the financial markets, just like we had after the financial crisis, which was kind of low and slow, but kept on going for a long time? Well, this one looks to me like a, a lot faster. Okay. And there were reasons that there was a combination of reasons why it was so slow last time. One of it was that this there was this legacy of excess household debt, uh, which is not the situation now. Another was that we had a lot of destructive fiscal austerity that was holding back the recovery. And, uh, the, you know, those by-elections in Georgia made all the difference. It means that this time, and Democrats have learned the lesson. So now that they have, even if it's a razor-thin majority, they're, they're not going to make that mistake again. They're going to go for a big package. And so I, I actually think this is going to be a very different story. I, if you believe some of the projections out there about growth, uh, it's going to be, it, it really is morning in America style growth that we may be looking at. We may be looking at something like the, you know, over, fourth quarter on fourth quarter, six, seven percent. Uh, this is, this is looking very, very different. Not at all the story. You know, don't, don't fight the last war on this one. Well, you know, it's interesting. So with that optimism, do you think we still need a stimulus package? And I think I know the answer to it because I know you've been supportive of it. Do you still think we need more help? Yeah, so it's not a stimulus package. It's mostly just not what it's about. It's a, it's an economic rescue package. It is, we have a miserable time. We won't be back to anything like full employment, even with all of this stuff, until early next year. And in the meantime, mass unemployment, uh, lots of disruption, many businesses in great, in, in terrible, under terrible stress. Uh, the state and local governments, it's very uneven, but many of them are still in deep, trouble and it's all about getting people through this not there there's no it, it's gratuitous we should not be having a lot of people suffering when we know that the economy is going to be coming back when america is not poor but a lot of individuals and a lot of businesses and some governments are very cash strapped so this is all about getting us through this is a bridge mm -hmm. it's not a stimulus it's a bridge across a chasm that we know is there but we know is limited in 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 width are you optimistic about the political will to get something this large done? I mean, even as you write in your book, Paul Krugman, in 21st century America, everything is political. This stimulus package certainly is one of those things. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's almost certainly. It's funny thing. The the stimulus. The, I, I hate calling it the stimulus package. The relief package is enormously popular. Has gigantic public approval. Relatively little disapproval. Even Republicans approve of it, and it will probably not get a single Republican vote in Congress. Right. There's a so serious disconnect the, there. There's a disconnect. It, it, the, the partisanship of the professional politicians is enormous. It's absolutely. It, if it's if it's good for America and as a Democrat is in the White House, they're against it. And so it's going to be a party line vote. But the, at the moment, uh, the Democrats, you know, the Democrats have 50 senators plus Kamala Harris. They have a narrow majority in the House, and they are probably going to stay unified. There may be a, a few things that are shaved off because the most conservative Democrats don't want them, but it's not its its not going to be a modest package. It's going to be a really big thing all the same. Well, do you feel like some of those zombie ideas and zombie arguments are going to come out, which is what you write about in your book, uh, You know, some of those erroneous economic ideas that, in particular, you find the politicians kind of you know trotting out when they need it. So I'm just curious what you're getting ready for. Oh well, we're, the, the uh, you know, debt debt uh, fears, which some didn't matter as long as, as Donald Trump was from the White House, are now back. Debt is, debt is an existential threat as long as there's a D after the president's name. Um, there are inflation. I mean, there there is a better case for thinking that we might have some inflation now than there was last time. But the the hyperinflation zombie is is back in full force. And other stuff, too. I mean, I think we're witnessing the, the birth of a new zombie, this whole thing in Texas where you have, you know, the natural gas pipelines freeze and, and it's somehow or other wind power caused it. So that's a and 
don't don't believe that evidence will ever change that. For uh, ten years from now, everybody on one side of the political spectrum will know that somehow it was the windmills that caused the the great freeze of Texas. So no, the zombies. That's the thing about zombies. No matter how times you, how many times you think you've killed them, they just keep on shambling along, eating our brains. So I want to make sure I, I I get this. You're not concerned about inflation with a and I'll use your term relief package of this size. No, I mean it's it is a big package. It could very well get us pretty much to full employment. But when I do the arithmetic and when I think about the risks, I it. Anyone who thinks that we're going to be, it's going to be 1979 all over again or something like that, it, the, the numbers just don't back that. We're, it, this is a big package. It is, for once, it looks like it might actually be big enough, but it's not big enough to produce something that is actually scary inflation. Well, and it's interesting, and I have someone actually tweeting at me, and they said, could you ask Paul if the Fed should start buying Bitcoin to pay off the national debt? <laughs> oh, God. I mean, uh, you know, the, the difference between Bitcoin and GameStop is that GameStop had the problem that there was an actual real business I used for it, which meant that there was some tether to its value. Bitcoin, because no one actually uses it, it's purely speculative, <laughs> the sky's the limit. Well, what do you think ultimately happens? I mean, do you have you thought about, I don't know, five years are we still talking about Bitcoin? Is it now that it's through, what, 52,000? Is it 100? Like, do, what, are, what are your projections on how this plays out, Paul? I mean, I, I, have, I have this problem, which is that you know, the Bitcoin's been around. It's hard to believe how long it's been around, and it's still not actually money. People don't actually use it for any significant amount of transactions. On the other hand, it just floats out there. And you, a lot of the things you can say about the uselessness of Bitcoin, you can also say about gold. Mm -hmm. And gold has kept its value for you know for five thousand years, despite basically being of very little real world use. So maybe Bitcoin just hangs in there. Uh, I don't know. It's hard. To, it's hard to figure. I can't quite get into the psychology, but there it is. When you say hang in there, what do you what do you mean? Do you mean it becomes part of a balance sheet at corporations like? Tesla said last week, like Elon Musk said, does it just hang out and, and continue to rise? Uh, does it drop well, in value significantly? Not rise in that limit, but maybe out there, maybe there'll be uh, Bitcoin at, you name a price, it's completely arbitrary, that maybe people will continue to hold Bitcoin and say, well, Bitcoin is valuable because other people think it's valuable, and it's... Uh, and there, there's never a moment of reckoning. I mean, it, it's. It, I mean, there's an alternative story where one day people, we have, we have a wily e. coyote moment. People look down, and realize there's nothing supporting it, and it just crashes to, to earth. But, but you know, that hasn't happened so far, and it's been around for a while. So maybe, uh, who knows? I mean, it's, it's one of those things where where I I, I don't know that it, that it, it's hard to make any rational argument about where the price should be, and maybe because there's no rational argument, it can be anything. One thing I did want to ask you, going back to the economy, Paul, is, you know, new administration, but the four years of Donald Trump and his administration, what impact or lasting impact do you think that that had on the U.S. economy? Well, there was a lot of wasted time. I mean, you know, we, we, had, we spent uh, 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 whatever it was, I guess, uh, 208 weeks waiting for inf infrastructure week to actually happen, and it never did. <laughs> um, so we didn't do any investment in the future. But I think one thing we did learn, uh, Trump uh, ran really a quite stimulative fiscal policy. We, it wasn't efficiently stimulative, but we did have uh, sustained budget deficits, and you know, nothing bad happened as a result of those deficits. And we also learned that the economy could run hotter than people, a lot harder than people had thought. I've looked back in 2015, the Fed thought 4.8% unemployment was full employment. And so we, we learned that the economy has more room to run. And that's something that somebody else can, you know, it's something that Biden can, can take advantage of that discovery and maybe actually use the the running room to actually build some infrastructure too. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 one thing to get back to full employment, but it's it's another thing to tackle inequality in this country. And one thing that's happened and been laid bare during this pandemic has been the gap between the haves and have-nots has grown in, has grown even more than it was before. What is the best way to tackle inequality in the U.S.? I think you have to do a, just. It's a, you have to do a bunch of things. There's no single magic, magic bullet. I mean, child, child tax credits can do a lot because it doesn't take a whole lot of money to vastly improve the, lots of, the lives of millions of children. Um, minimum wage, 
not sure we're going to get the $15, but a higher minimum wage helps. Uh, labor, I, one of the things sort of under the radar things is that the Biden administration is more pro-union organizing than any administration we've had in decades. And that might make a difference in terms of enhancing workers' bargaining power. Uh, and then there's other stuff. I mean, uh, I don't know if we're, if, whether an Elizabeth Warren wealth tax is, is anywhere in the near future, but you can make a start. There's certainly, uh, there, there's no one thing. What you just need is, is a, a government, a Congress that that tries to improve the lot of people who are in the bottom half of the income distribution. And um, we really haven't done that at all for a long time. So we might be surprised at how well it works if we finally start doing it. Are, are, you, are you concerned that a wealth tax would, would drive people out of the country, would drive the wealthiest out of the country? I think uh, it would be you know, a little bit. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that, uh, let's put it this way, uh, taxes are in, in New York City, which is where I spend most of my time. The tax rate on, on high-income people in New York City is considerably higher than it is in, uh, in, you know, in other parts of the country. And they don't see a lot of wealthy people uh, moving to Kansas. They're going to Miami. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're going to Miami and, and no, Austin. They're going to Miami, but some, but uh, but, <laughs> but even that. I mean, the fact there's some there's some mobility of people, but it's the yeah. idea that everybody is ready to move. Uh, there are a lot of things that matter in life more than your tax rate, and that that will continue to be true. Hey, listen, one thing I wanted to get your thoughts on, Paul, because we caught up, uh, our David Weston uh, for this week's Wall Street Week, caught up with Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary, and they yeah. talked about the stimulus plan. You know Summers has been... Oh, right. actually, hang on for a second, because uh, President Biden is walking to a podium. He's in Michigan. He has been touring a yeah. Pfizer factory, uh, and he is expected to make some comments. Uh, looks like he's getting a little bit of an introduction uh, by uh, the folks that are guiding him on his tour. Do we want to go there or do we want to hold off, guys? All right, we're going to hold on. Let's. So let's, let's stay with um, uh, Paul Krugman, who's still with us. But he's been critical, and I think his concern is, I was going to play some sound, but he cites you specifically, and he's concerned about people, I think you've talked about maybe people kind of shoring up their own finances, and he's concerned that that's not the best use of uh, any kind of relief package, COVID relief package. What do you say to that? Oh, I, uh, the, there are different parts of the relief package. And the part that's the most popular, which is the $1,400 checks, is also the least targeted. So some of that money will go to people who really badly need it. Uh, but a lot of the money will go to people who have been doing okay in the pandemic. Um, and if we were short of money, I would worry about that. Mm. But we're not. The U.S. government can borrow at incredibly low interest rates. Debt is not a pressing concern. Um, Larry is, I understand. I mean, Larry is, <laughs> Larry is not stupid. Let's say, let's say that. <laughs> we, we, we actually had a debate on this uh, at the Princeton webinar last week. Um, and it's a, if people spend a lot of that, there is some risk of overheating. But I think the uh, the odds are that to the extent that we're giving a lot of money to people who are not urgently in need of it, they're also likely to not spend it right away. So there, I, I think it's, you know, if we had unlimited time to craft a very careful proposal and had unlimited ability to distinguish who really needed the money, then you could probably achieve what we needed with a somewhat smaller package. But that's not where we are. We need to get mm -hmm. this thing out the door now. And so I'm okay with it. So, yeah. So, okay if some people save a little bit and shore up their finances, but you're thinking, I, you know, and I think I've heard, we've heard this a lot, that if we overshoot it, it's okay because there's a lot of people who are really hurting right now. Yeah, and we've had an object lesson in from, from 2009 about what happens if you undershoot, which is you mm -hmm. don't get a second chance. That's so, a great, but yeah. that's a great point, right? We learned <laughs> in the financial crisis. Yeah, no, that's right. In fact, occasionally, some of us, uh, you know, the zombies keep on shambling along regardless, but some of us actually do, I hope, learn some lessons from, from experience. Hey, Paul Krugman, did you get a chance to check out yesterday's testimony from the CEO of Robinhood and CEO of Reddit, CEO of Citadel, and more? I, you know, I read the accounts of it. I didn't uh, sit through it. You know, I have to say, I just cannot get worked up about any of this. <laughs> Why not? The, the, because, look, we have, a, we have a huge problem of inequality in the United States. We have a huge problem that ordinary people are not not getting enough and are not, are not 
uh, don't have adequate uh, lifestyles. Uh, the way out of that is not for everybody to become a day trader. Right? This is not. This is this is always going to be marginal, and the this whole stock trading thing. The, there are no good guys in this story. I mean, the, obviously the hedge funds are not lovable, but you know, putting a short squeeze. Uh, on 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 a hedge fund, even if it's done by a bunch of small investors, is also not a lovable thing to be doing. Uh, and people are complaining that you know that Robinhood stopped trading, but you know what? The people who are blocked from buying at that point actually, in many cases, were prevented from losing a lot of money because <laughs> they would have been buying a GameStop at ridiculous prices. So I, but altogether, this is a like. This is like a drama that involves mm -hmm. people and issues that I don't see why the rest of us should care about. But it does it does raise a point, which is that in, regular people have access to financial markets now in a way that they have never had before yeah. with zero commission trading. And, and they can do what used to cost hundreds of dollars to do to make a single trade. Is that a good thing? Is it good to have that kind of access? Probably not. In the end, I mean, I'm not going to say that it should be denied because we can't. Uh, it's a it's a free country, and if if this can be done, I, I don't want to be too paternalistic. But the fact of the matter is that if you're an ordinary investor, you should not be doing. You should not be stock picking. You should not be. You, you don't have the resources to figure that out. And the uh, you know what what all the personal finance experts tell you is buy index funds, do things that, you know, you should probably should be in the market some, but you should not be playing the market. And this is, so making that easier for people to do is actually not a good thing. So I want to squeeze in because I, I know we will have to ultimately go to the president, but I want to ask you about something in your book and you write, you know, in terms of things that are important, the most important thing is, and you say, sometimes I wonder whether I'm wasting my time talking about any other issue other than climate change. If we don't get that right, if we don't put policies in place, nothing else matters. That's right. If, 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 if we really have if climate change is potentially uh, a civilization destroying event. This is and it's it, you know I don't really care what productivity is if there's no civilization to be productive in. And so, um, so that is the most important thing. Now, the 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 you know technology is our friend. Renewable energy has been uh, a miraculous story this past 15 years, and the, the the possibilities with actually fairly moderate policies to bring climate contain, climate change under control are huge. So that's something that we should be very um, excited about, but we have to do it. And of course, we have to go around and we have to be reasonable and not say somehow that windmills caused uh, natural gas pipelines to freeze. Right. That's You took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, we saw it happen this week with the governor of, of Texas. Um, I, 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 I do wonder in this political, in this politically charged environment, what is an effective way to get the urgency of the climate change message across? Because there are a large number of people in Washington, who do not think it's a priority. Yeah, well, that's what that's what may do us. And I don't know what what you can do except to try to make the case, and for those who who do have some power to do something about it, to uh, to use the levers they have. It's, I mean, we're luckily. It turns out we. It, there was a time when fighting climate change looked like a real kind of eat your spinach root canal thing that it was going to be extremely expensive and hard and and it looked hopeless. Now it looks like just a fairly modest financial nudges towards uh, climate friendly technologies can actually make all the difference and maybe just maybe we can do that. Uh, we better hope so for the sake of of the next few generations. Paul Krugman, if you were sitting down with the president uh, and his team or the president one-on-one -on -one and you said, hey, this is one economic policy you've got to get right right now, what would you say? Oh, I mean, right. I mean, they, I, I, I'm for, I guess we're not supposed to call the Green New Deal Build Back Better, but I think a <laughs> kind of a combination of, of uh, infrastructure investment with a strong climate change focus is, yeah. is the way to go. That's right. how we're going to do it. Good stuff. Paul Krugman, thank you so much. His book, Arguing with Zombies, Economics, Politics, and the Fight for a Better Future, it is in paperback, and you can find it now. Paul Krugman, of course, New York Times columnist, Nobel laureate, and uh, thank you so much for all that time. What a great conversation. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked about so much, including COVID, and we know that uh, President Biden has uh, been in Kalamazoo touring a manufacturing plant, a Pfizer manufacturing plant. It's one of three U.S. manufacturing plants that are making the Pfizer vaccine. Let's take 
take you there now. The president getting ready to make some comments. The, the uh, credit you've given me that I really don't deserve. This is, uh, this is a case of life and death. We're talking about uh, people's lives. I want, to, I want you to know that once we beat the COVID, we're going to do everything we can to end cancer as we know it. I've asked Dr. Eric Lander, a renowned Harvard MIT scientist, to co-lead the Presidential Council of Advisors in Science and Technology and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. These are White House offices that bring together the country's top scientists and address our most pressing needs. They'll be part of the administration's work to develop a DARPA-like advanced research effort on cancer and other diseases, just like there is DARPA in the Defense Department that develops the breakthroughs to protect our country. This administration is going to be guided by science to save lives and to make lives better. That's why I wanted to come here, Albert, to thank you, to thank all the workers here in Kalamazoo. And I'm here to thank my good friend, Governor Whitmer, and she has become a good and close friend. The governor's been on the front lines of this pandemic as well for a long time, and I think she's doing an incredible job in a very difficult circumstances. And Michigan is also fortunate to have my buddy Gary Peters as United States Senator and Debbie Stabenow. Gary is here. Gary has been a workhorse in making sure that we move through this funding to get things done. Because he understands better than anyone, it's about urgency, the urgency of the moment. So, Gary, thank you, Senator. Thank you for all you're doing. Last week, I, uh, I toured the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. I met world-class doctors, scientists, and researchers who were critical for discovering the vaccines in record time. I remember when we first started talking about this, asking Dr. Fauci and others, said, well, it could take up to several years, maybe as many as six or eight years, to find, find a vaccine. It's a miracle of science and the brilliant minds that we have around us. And now it's a second miracle the miracle of manufacturing to produce hundreds of millions of doses. Let me say it again, hundreds of millions of doses. I came here because I want the American people to understand the extraordinary, extraordinary work that's being done to undertake the most difficult operational challenges this nation has ever faced. And let me say parenthetically that it's not enough that we find cures for Americans. There needs to be a cure that the world is able to take part of, because you can't build a wall or a fence high enough to keep a pandemic out. On our tour, I met a few of your nearly 3,000 workers, Albert, experts managing ingredients that come in from different cities and states, experts handling 3D modeling and artificial intelligence to ensure that every dose is properly crafted, experts ensuring envir sterile environments so that each vial, each and every one, is safe and free of contaminants. All of this is followed by extensive safety and quality control inspection, then careful packaging and labeling. We walk by a freezer farm that, uh, that then keeps uh, do those doses viable so they can be shipped. This is an incredibly complex process. And at every stop, safety is the utmost priority. The whole process takes teamwork, precision, and round-the-clock focus. Machinists operating some of the most advanced equipment in the world, working side-by-side -side with chemists, biologists, pioneering technologies that less than a year ago were little more than theories and aspirations. And it takes a partnership, in our view, between the federal government and all the companies and universities contributing to the vaccine effort. Just over four weeks ago, America had no real plan to vaccinate most of the country. My predecessor, as my mother would say, God love him, failed to order enough vaccines, failed to mobilize the effort to administer the shots, failed to set up vaccine centers. That changed the moment we took office. I directed Jeff Science, my COVID-19 response coordinator, 
to lead my administration's work with the vaccine manufacturers to buy more vaccines and to speed up delivery. Albert referenced it earlier, and I want to thank him for making it happen because we work together. We're now on track to have enough vaccine supply for all Americans by the end of July. It doesn't mean it'll be in all Americans' arms, but enough vaccine will be available by that time. These orders allow facilities like this one to plan ahead, accelerate the production schedules. Here's what else we did. When we discovered that vaccine manufacturers weren't being prioritized when it came to scrutinizing and securing supplies they needed, we fixed that problem and got them what they needed. We also used the Defense Production Act to speed up the supply chain for for key equipment, like fill pumps and filters, which has already helped increase vaccine production. In fact, on our tour tour today, they showed me a critical piece of machinery they didn't have before. Now they do, and it's allowing them to ramp up production. And as we increase supply, we're carrying out a clear plan to get shots into the arms of 300 million Americans or more. And I know people want confidence that it's safe. Well, I just toured, and it's where it's being made. It takes more time to do the check for safety than it does actually to make the vaccine. That's how fastidious they are. And listen to Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci assured me that COVID-9 vaccines were safe. That's why several weeks ago I went through the rigorous scientific review. That's why I took my vaccine shot publicly to demonstrate to the American people that I know and believe it's safe. That's why Vice President Harris also received a shot publicly. We all know there's some history and there's some hesitancy about taking this vaccine. We all know there's history in this country of having subjected certain communities to terrible medical abuses in the past. But if there's one message to cut through to everyone in this country is this. The vaccines are safe. Please, for yourself, your family, your community, this country, take the vaccine when it's your turn and available. That's how to beat this pandemic. And we're making progress. We deployed more vaccinators, the people to put the vaccine in your arm. We're now making it possible for retired doctors and nurses to come back and under law administer these shots. We've put new vaccinators in the field. These include over 800 medical personnel from our commission corps at the Department of Health and Human Services and personnel from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, Defense Department, National Guard. We're literally lining up, we're lining up thousands of vaccinators because it's one thing to have the vaccine is very different to get it in someone's arms. We're also creating more places for people to get vaccinated. We provided $3 billion to states, territories, and tribes to create hundreds of new vaccination centers to ramp up exi- and ramp up the existing ones that now that are there. Right here in Michigan with Governor Whitmer, FEMA has provided tens of millions of dollars to bolster the state's community vaccination centers. From the National Guard at the Expo Center here in Kalamazoo to the the TCF Center in Detroit, to parking lots and churches across the state. We've worked with governors in California, Texas, New York, and more to come to stand up massive, mass vaccine sites and stadiums that will be open 24-7 in arenas and community centers. It's an effort that's on top of the federal government covering the full cost for the state's use of their National Guards for pandemic efforts. And you suggested I do that a while ago, and I promised you I'd do it, and we did it. We also started shipping vaccines directly to thousands of local pharmacies across the country so eligible folks can get the COVID-19 shot like they would a flu shot. Here in Michigan, that's already more than 220 pharmacies like Rite Aid and Myers in more than 130 cities in Michigan. And that's just the beginning. It's only been four weeks. And for folks who aren't near a pharmacy or mass vaccination centers, we're deploying mobile clinics. These are special vehicles and pop-up clinics that meet folks where they live, folks who don't have access to transportation to get the shots. We're also supplying vaccines to community health centers 
Federal Community Health Center to reach those who are hit the hardest, black, Latinos, Native Americans, and rural communities, which have higher rates of COVID infections and deaths than any other group. Here in Michigan, we're already partnering with community health centers, serving more than 370,000 patients in 11 cities across the state. That's because you guys have pointed out where they were, why it was so important, and how we get to, as Gary talks about, get to the people most in need and the people most dying from COVID. It's important to ensure everyone is treated equally and those hardest hit get the care they deserve. We're now at a point where we've seen the average daily number of people vaccinated nearly double from the week before I took office to about 1.7 million average per day getting a shot. We're on track to surpass my commitment. You may remember when I said in my first 100 days just before I was inaugurated, it seemed like 100 days, but anyway, first 100 days before I was inaugurated, that we'd administer 100 million shots in my first 100 days. But we're on the path to do that. We're averaging 1.7 million a day. Soon we'll be at 50 million, and I'm confident we'll exceed the number. But that's just the floor. We have to keep going. But despite the progress, we're still in the teeth of a pandemic. New strains are emerging. In a few days, we'll cross 500,000 Americans who will have died from COVID-19. 500,000. That is almost 70,000 more than all the Americans who died in World War II over a four-year period. All the sorrow, all the heartache, all the pain. And while we wait for everyone to get vaccinated, we still need you to wash your hands, stay socially distanced, and mask up to help save lives. That's why, with the authority I have as president, I signed an executive order, the only authority I have to require this, to require masking on all federal property, all modes of travel like planes, trains, and buses. We've been calling on governors and mayors and local officials, Republicans and Democrats, to institute mask mandates within their jurisdictions, just like Governor Whitmer has done here in Michigan. Look, I know it's inconvenient, but you're making a difference when you do it. Everything we do matters. We need everyone to do their part for themselves, for their loved ones, and yes, for your country. It's a patriotic duty. We need Congress to pass my American Rescue Plan that deals with the immediate crisis, the urgency. Now, critics say my plan is too big, that it costs $1.9 trillion. So that's too much. Well, let me ask them. What would they have me cut? What would they have me leave out? Should we not invest $20 billion to vaccinate the nation? Should we not invest $290 million to extend unemployment insurance for the 11 million Americans who are unemployed so they can get by while they get back to work? Should we not invest $50 billion to help small businesses stay open when tens of thousands have had to close permanently? Should we not invest? And by the way, they make up half the employment in America. Should we not invest $130 million to help schools across the nation open safely? Right now, 24 million adults, 11 million children, don't have enough food to eat. And lest you think I'm exaggerating, think of those scenes you've seen on the television with cars lined up which seem like miles to wait to have someone put a box of food in their trunk. People never, ever, 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 ever thought they would need help. And through no fault of their own, they're in that circumstance. If we don't pass the American Rescue Plan, 40 million Americans will lose, lose nutritional assistance through a program we call SNAP, the old food stamp program. Do we not invest $3 million, $3 billion to keep families from going hungry? One in five Americans are behind in their rent. 
one in 10 are behind on their mortgages. How many people do you know that will go to bed tonight staring to the ceiling and say, God, what is going to happen if I don't get my job, if I don't have my unemployment check? What's happened to me? I'm losing my health insurance. What do I do? This is the United States of America, for God's sake. We invest in people who are in need. Do we not invest $35 billion to help people keep a roof over their heads? I could go on, but you get the point. I'm grateful that the Senate and the House are moving quickly. And I'm prepared to hear their ideas how to make the package better and make it cheaper. I'm open to that. But we have to make clear who is helped and who is hurt. And my hope is that the Republicans in Congress listen to their constituents. According to the polls, there is overwhelming bipartisan support. The vast majority of the American people, more than 70 percent of the American people, with all the polls you all conduct, including the majority of Republicans, want us to act and act big and quickly and support the plan. Major economists, left, right, and center, say we should focus on smart investments we can make now in jobs and our people to prevent long-term economic damage to our nation and to strengthen the economic competitiveness going forward. In fact, an analysis by the Wall Street firm Moody's estimates that if we pass my American Rescue Plan, the economy will create 7 million jobs this year. This year. We've also been in constant contact with mayors and governors, county officials, members of Congress, both parties, both parties. I've met with them in my office. I've met with them in on the on the internet on, on on zooming on with them both parties in every state and guess what they agree we have to act now i got a letter from more than 400 mayors from big cities and small towns they understand we're not going to get our economy back in shape and the millions of people back to work until we beat this virus that's why the american rescue plan puts 160 million billion dollars into more testing and tracing, manufacturing and distribution, and setting up vaccination sites. Everything is needed to get vaccines into people's arms, which is the most difficult logistical effort the United States has undertaken in peacetime. It includes $4 billion for new manufacturing plants. So we're ready to manufacture vaccines in the future. We don't have to wait. I'm going to close with what I said before. I'll always be straight with you. I said in my inaugural, I'll be, be, give it to you straight from the shoulder, as Roosevelt said. Because the American people can take the truth. They can handle anything. I can't give you a date when this crisis will end. But I can tell you, we're doing everything possible to have that day come sooner rather than later. And all of you here are doing some of the most important work in this facility right here that can be done. And I know this is personal. I walked in today, and I won't say who came up to me, but one of the people in this building came up to me and said, my father-in-law is dying from COVID. I said, can I call him? He said, no, he couldn't take a call. He's just keeping his prayers, please. How many of you know somebody who's in real trouble or has passed? How many people do you know who sat down to breakfast this morning and looked at an empty chair across the table? You've seen the devastation of this virus in your family, your community, but you're stepping up. You're saving lives here, lives of your loved ones, your neighbors, your fellow Americans. You're showing how this town, this state, this country, takes care of our own leaves nobody behind we can do anything when we do it together i believe we're on the road i promise you i know we'll run into bumps it's not going to be easy here to the end but we're going to beat this we're going to beat this may god bless you all and may god protect our troops and Albert, thank you and your people for all you do thank you
All right, that, of course, was uh, President Biden there in Michigan. You're listening to Bloomberg. This is breaking news from Bloomberg. And let's just get to some of those major headlines from President Biden there in Michigan. Uh, President Biden saying that uh, President Trump failed to order enough COVID vaccines, Tim. Yeah, the president also saying that the U.S. will have enough vaccine for public by the end of July. And he urges Americans to take the COVID vaccine, saying, hey, this is why I got it on TV. And this is why Vice President Kamala Harris got it on TV. They are safe. Yeah, exactly. And reminding us that the pandemic toll here in the United States alone will soon reach 500,000, so half a million. Those are big, big numbers. All right, you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Tim Stanovic. Let's get another check on that trading day just 15 minutes away from the close. Here is Charlie Pellet. And wrapping up a holiday shortened trading week, we are looking at a down week right now for the S&P. It is a mixed Friday. S&P lower by three right to the numbers. We'll give you the why in a moment here. S&P now at 39.11, down one-tenth of one percent. The Dow up 52 higher by two-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ up 13. That is a gain of one-tenth of one percent. Stocks mix. Benchmark Treasury yields climbing to the highest in a year, renewing concern that rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the American economic recovery. Right now, the 10-year yield, 1.34 percent. Gold up three-tenths of one percent, 1781 the ounce. Oil is declining as production begins to come back online. West Texas Intermediate crude down 2.4 percent, 59.05 a barrel. Natural gas down five tenths of one percent, 306 per million BTUs. Recapping stocks mixed, lower little changed on the SP, down now by one point. Bitcoin, by the way, surging now at $55,550. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you, Charlie Pellet. This is Bloomberg. Um, like Love Shack? Is it B-52s? Yes. Yeah, okay. It is. Yeah, I, I figured. It was a giveaway. <laughs> well, you know what? I thought it sounded like them, but I couldn't tell if it was, I don't know, it just sounded a little off for me, so I was having a hard well, time. It was a later uh, song uh, for them. I mean, it didn't go back to that debut album with the uh, songs like Rock Lobster on it. Rock so, Lobster. So, you know, maybe yeah. that's why. It's anyway. a great one. It's a great one. So how does that relate to your chart of the day? You know, you think about good stuff from a market perspective, and the word quality comes into play. Mm. And uh, what we've seen now for close to a year as stocks have risen is that investors aren't all that concerned about quality. It's something that uh, I ran across about a week ago when uh, Eddie Elfenbein, who uh, is the editor of the Crossing Wall Street blog, uh, did a chart. He was comparing a Fidelity exchange traded fund with the S&P 500. Uh, the chart kind of takes that and runs with it a little bit, uh, looking at the underlying index for the ETF, whose ticker, by the way, is FQAL, if anyone's interested. And uh, it's the Fidelity U.S. Quality Factor Index, comparing that with the Russell 1000. Uh, you know, the Fidelity Index, you know, the universe they work with is 1,000 stocks, so the Russell 1000 seemed like a reasonable comparison. And what you find out is that the ratio between those two indicators, so the quality stocks and the Russell 1000, peaked in early April and fell about 8% through Tuesday. It's back to its lowest level since July 2008. Now, if you look back then, the ratio was going up. We're in the middle of a bear market, so people wanted quality. Now that we're in a bull market uh, that's getting close to a year, quality, not so much of an issue. Uh, and if you want to know more, folks, send me an email. I'll get you the chart, the explanation that goes with it. And uh, everything I do going forward, the email address is dwilson at bloomberg.net. That's dwilson at bloomberg.net. All right, Dave, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. That, of course, was our Bloomberg Stocks uh, editor, Dave Wilson, with his chart of the day. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. We've just got mm, about 10 minutes left in today's uh, trading session. Let's do the drive to the close, and let's get to our next guest. And joining us once again, delighted to have him back with us, is Eric Jackson, founder president of the Toronto-based hedge fund, and he joins us once again on the phone in Toronto. Eric, how are you? 
Hey, Carolyn. Great. How are you? Doing okay. Doing okay. How's this year stacking up for you? You guys, you had a great year last year. Does Are the trends and the momentum continuing for you? Uh, I would say i definitely off to a good start and i um, pleased with uh, how things have worked out. Um, uh, you know, you have occasional days like yesterday and the day before where everything in tech seems out of favor and uh, people say uh, the world is ending and now's the time to jump back into value stocks. But um, I, I don't subscribe to that. I, I generally think we're, we're still in the early days of a long-term uh, secular bull market. And uh, I, you know, I'm sticking with uh, a lot of the positions that worked in 2020 uh, through 2021 and beyond. Okay, so we last had you on in, in December. Wrap up how EMJ Capital uh, performed in, uh, by the end of the year. Um, well, I, you know, I'm not allowed to kind of quote um, my performance stats, uh, you know, chapter and verse, but uh, it was a very good year for, for sure. Um, we did very well. Um, I, I, you know, I think I attribute it to a, a few things. Uh, one, definitely we, we were very bullish starting the first week of April. Uh, coming out of the, the, the woes of the, of the pandemic. Um, and then uh, also post-election, U.S. election, um, uh, you know, I, I had a very bullish bias that, uh, you know, things would, would rally into the year end, and that's how things work. So um, a, lot of, a lot of tech names did well, but, um, you know, some of my favorite names in the portfolio did particularly well. Yeah. Hey, so we just talked with Paul Krugman, Nobel laureate, and he's pretty optimistic. Um, you know, once we get through, I think what he says is still maybe another rough six months or so, but then pretty pretty optimistic about the outlook after there. So let's talk names like Zillow. You like it? I like it. I've loved it for a while, actually. Yeah. I, first, I first bought it a couple of years ago when it was $29, and one of the co-founders, Rich Barton, came back as CEO. Um, primarily, everyone kind of knows Zillow for, you know, going on the app and wanting to see what Tim's, the price of Tim's house is in, in Brooklyn or whatever, <laughs> uh, and kind of cre- cre- creep him. Um, but, uh, um, you know, Rich, the reason, one of the reasons why Rich came back, though, a couple of years ago is that they were, they decided, you know, they had a choice. They had an existential choice. They had Open Door, which is now a public company, um, which, which I also own a small piece of, uh, but was really pioneering a, a model called iBuying, which basically was uh, they wanted to do to the home buying market what Uber has done to ride sharing, where they wanted to kind of get, a, get the middleman uh, of the or middle woman, uh, the real estate agent, out of the way. And actually, if you went on their site, you typed in your own um, address. Uh, they would say, well, here, here's your home, here's what its value is today, and we'll actually buy it from you today. Uh, we'll make you this cash offer of such and such a price. Um, and nobody had done that before, and, and Zillow had to decide, are we going to let Open Door take this and run with it, or are we actually going to try to use our market leader position uh, in this space to, to be the, the, the dominant player in this space? And Rich decided he wanted to jump in with both feet, come back, take over uh, as CEO, uh, there were a lot of skeptics at the time. There were Steve Eisman was saying, you know, oh, this is a sign of another 2000, 2007 um, bubble in real estate. If, if uh, the Zillows of the world are getting into flipping houses, but I, I think it was uh, prescient. Um, and we're still in the early days of that whole model. But you know, with each passing quarter and since the pandemic, uh, we certainly found that. Uh, for one, one real estate agents need Zillow more than ever uh, for leads, but um, more and more people are willing to dip their toes in the water of, of trying this new model. And I, I kind of liken it to Carvana, where you know four years ago nobody knew what Carvana was. Nobody, you know, they thought it was kind of weird this idea of like buying cars online and having it, you know, shipped to your house or going and right. picking it up. Uh, but now it's now if we haven't bought a car ourselves through Carvana, we probably know somebody in our life who has done it. I don't think many of us know people who've yet pressed the button and sold their home on Zillow, but I think that a couple of years years from now we will, and that's the opportunity still in front of the company. We actually did a story for Business Week uh, back in, I think, early 2019. It's Zillow wants to flip your house, but it, it is interesting how they're making it a much easier easier process. Um, let's talk about another name. Yes, yeah, Sonos is one that I'm eager to hear from you about. Uh, the stock was at $6.58 back in March of 2020. It's now at thirty. Six dollars and ninety six cents. Uh, what's uh, why are you so excited about Sonos? It's kind of a value play in in the tech world for me, um, Tim. Because I think for, for a long time I was looking at this name. You know, everyone kind of you know either has a Sonos or you know had one at one point. 
likes seems to like the company in a lot of ways, and yet its multiple was never very high, especially when you compared it to other, you know, prestige hardware companies like say a Logitech or a Garmin or somebody like that. Uh, and so, and I think the big reason why is people said, well, it's not a recurring business. You know, I buy one Sonos for my house, right. and that's it. It's not like I'm hooked on it for life, and I'm and I'm gonna. But you add to, to it, it. from know. someone who is a Sonos owner. You keep adding. You get one for every yeah. room. <laughs> no, I, I I totally agree, Carol. And you know, that full transparency. My and, and, and and my view was that you know I've held this stock for a couple of years now, and for for a long part of that time it hasn't really worked. But my view is that you know yes, it, it is a recurring business, and they have done some things in the last year. Um, besides just like buying more hardware to, to, to add on to different rooms, um, they now launched a, a radio service you can subscribe to on a monthly basis and things like that. Uh, and it, it's just even even with all the competition from Apple and you know Amazon mm-hmm. and and all these titans of tech, you know it's still a dominant brand. So I think the opportunity in the year ahead and, and into next year is that. Is this going to get a multiple of, of a large tech and a garment? And if it and if it does, and I think it's well on its way, and next month they're having an analyst day that I think should be a catalyst for the stock. I, you know, it's it's, it's had a great run. It's around thirty five bucks now, but I I like the stock to to go to ninety dollars over the next eighteen months. Right, and it looks like they're coming out with headphones too. That's been kind of all over um, social media. I mean, this this stock has been on a tear. So I mean, investors are are definitely you know excited about it. Um, God, I wish we had more time. Uh, can we just get like twenty seconds from you on Bitcoin? Everyone on Twitter is eager to ask me, ask you, for me to ask you about Bitcoin at fifty five thousand dollars a coin right now. Are you thinking about adding it to a portfolio? Uh, I'm not. I, I, you know, I guess I'll put myself in the Ken Griffin camp. You know, I, I, it's hard for me to put a value on it. I say God bless to everyone who wants to jump into it, uh, and my kids are among them. But you know, for me, it's it's just not something I'm playing in right now. All right, you're you Jeff. Thank you so much. Eric Jackson, be well, founder and president of EMJ Capital, on the phone once again uh, from Toronto. Uh, really interesting in terms of the plays and the enthusiasm. Yeah, still yeah. thinks there's a, a lot of uh, lot of growth left in terms of, of, of those growth stocks. Sonos up 57% already this year. Wow. This year, wow. <laughs> after a run last year. <laughs> Stick around. We've got the closing bell in just a moment.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. There you have it, sound of the closing bell at the New York Stock Exchange. The Dow swinging between gains and losses as that bell clangs at the New York Stock Exchange. A down day for the S&P 500 index, a losing week as well. Bottom line, stocks mixed. Benchmark Treasury yields climbing to the highest level in a year, renewing concern that rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. S&P down seven, ending the week, heading into the weekend of 39.06, a drop now of two-tenths of one percent. The Dow up barely, eking out a one-point gain to 31,494. NASDAQ up nine to 13,874, a gain of about one-tenth of one percent. Again, the 10-year worth repeating, 1.33 percent. Bitcoin, 55,355, up today by 6.4%. Gold up three tenths of one percent, 1781 the ounce. West Texas Intermediate crude lower by 2.6 percent. Oil declining today. U.S. production beginning to come back online. WTI now at 58.97. Natural gas down four tenths of one percent. Net gas 307 per million BTUs. As for the market backdrop, Eric Jackson is president and founder of EMG Capital, and he was our guest moments ago right here on Bloomberg Business Week. I generally think we're we're still in the early days. Of a long-term uh, secular bull market, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm sticking with uh, a lot of the positions that worked in 2020 uh, through 2021 and beyond. Deer and Company shares uh, jumped 9.9 percent today. Deer lifting its earnings guidance above analyst estimates with high crop prices and an improving farm economy set to translate into a record windfall for the biggest maker of agricultural machinery. Also, after earnings, applied materials up today by 5.3 percent. Recapping mixed Friday, S&P lower, down seven, a drop of two tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Wild thing, think you move me. I got a few moves I know you'll like. Shake it all over. Bloomberg Business Week. Movers and shakers. Shaking. It's not stirring. On Bloomberg Radio. So, yeah, let's dig a little bit deeper into the trade. So funny, Tim and I were just talking off air, and I was saying, eh, like nothing really happened this week. I mean, a lot of things happened this week, but if I looked at where the major equity averages finished up for the week, it's little changes. Uh, fractionally higher on the Dow, fractionally lower on the S&P, down about 1% on the NASDAQ. But it just felt like we weren't going anywhere. It did. You just gave away that even during the breaks, we're talking about the markets. <laughs> we are. We're nerds. <laughs> it's what's through happening Through and here. through. <laughs> I mean, even the S&P today, a little bit of a risk on trade, but just barely. 296 names in the S&P 500. If you use this as a metric, they were higher. 208 names uh, in the S&P were lower. One unchanged, Tim. And what happened with industry groups today? Yeah, digging a little deeper into the Bloomberg industry groups, materials uh, by far the leader of the pack, up 1.84%, uh, followed by energy, 1.65% to the upside. Industrials higher by 1.6%. Uh, though, um, you know, six of the industry groups were lower today. Utilities down 1.5%. Consumer staples down 1.2%. And healthcare down 1.14%. So let's bring in Bloomberg News markets reporter Abigail Doolittle. Um, you know what I mean, Abigail? You just have one of those days where it's just like, and even the week, there were, there were things that happened. We did have moves, but by the end, it's just like, okay, we didn't go really anywhere. <laughs> you know, Carol, it's so funny that you're saying this because sometimes <laughs> these short weeks feel super long and as though they are just sort of meandering around. And on the day, it was certainly the case. It felt like the S&P 500 was going to hold its bid earlier, up just slightly the first up day in four. Mm. But at the end of the day, a small loss. You know what probably stands out a little bit more in this week where it does feel like not too much happened is that we had the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ and the Russell 2000, for that matter, that small cap index that everybody's watching, down on the week. And the reason this stands out is not because the losses are so big, about around 1% or so, but because we have that 10-year yield up more than 10 basis points, backing up on a weekly basis the most since early January. So when you add it all together, it does tell you that even though we haven't seen a big sell-off that folks might expect, we have seen some sort of uh, meandering, mixed action that led to a weekly decline as rates uh, climb. And that 10-year yield, if you can believe it, I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of stunning 
according to some, 1.34%. It is pretty stunning. <laughs> yeah, so 1.34% so are, are you know, not seen in quite a long time and a very quick rise for the, the yield. What, what's the story that that tells us? Well, hopefully it tells us about uh, a reflationary theme, a reopening economy, uh, that the reopening that everybody's hoping for on vaccine optimism is going to go smoothly. The fear, though, is that if it happens too quickly, everybody's talking about, well, the 10-year yield can go to 1.5 percent and it's not going to be a problem for stocks if it's for the right reasons. So the right reasons, that reopening. However, if people start to sniff out that it's inflation, then uh, it could be a bit of an issue. So that's one reason. Uh, you may have the Fed saying, you know, any sort of inflationary uh, pressures are transitory, uh, hoping to perhaps jawbone the idea that all is smooth here, that you have everything r rising for the right reasons. And right now, the fact that we have not had a big stock sell off, we do again have stocks down a little bit on the week, suggests that, you know, we are in a relatively healthy digestion period. Well, exactly. You know, it's interesting that you say that because we talked with Paul Krugman, a Nobel laureate. We were talking a little bit about the economy being able to run a little bit hot. And we were bringing that up with, you know, what did we, is there something that maybe Donald Trump did with his administration that we learned that had maybe a lasting impact on the U.S. economy? And one of the things he talked about is this idea that maybe you can let the economy run a little bit hot and we can deal with it. And I do think about even though rates are, historically still really low, that even if we start to edge near 2%, there is some comfort, and we've seen this from Jay Powell and the Fed, that it's okay maybe and will be maybe okay to run things just a little bit hotter than we were maybe normally used to doing. That's certainly the argument from uh, at least a theoretical standpoint, yes. to the best of my ability to know, because there is a cure for inflation, and it's called, uh, you know, rising, then bringing rates higher. For deflation and stagflation, which are the situations that have been faced in scarier time periods, not so much over the last year, but certainly out of the financial crisis, there really isn't a known cure. That's the liquidity trap. So monetary policy people, they want to make sure that, that that does not happen. So that may be a piece of why they're ready to and have been throwing the kitchen sink at the situation. But where there is big price inflation, Carol and Tim, I was just looking at Bitcoin, above $55,000, another record, and you guys know that I love charts, 171% <laughs> above its 200-day moving average. If that is not extended and frothy, I don't know what is. That's overbought on steroids. Unbelievable. <laughs> and some of those stocks, too, Riot uh, blockchain up 15% uh, today. So all in on the speculation for Bitcoin. Of course, Elon Musk, Tesla's uh, CEO, today really giving it a bit of a, you know, another feather right. in its cap saying that he might prefer Bitcoin cryptocurrency over cash. Who knew? <laughs> Gotta love it. And when I say overbought, you just look at the charts. It's overbought. It's not my opinion. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, it is technically uh -huh. it is so extended. It's unbelievable. You know, the funny thing is a connection between Bitcoin and Tesla from a chart standpoint, the only parabolic chart that I've ever seen has, has not corrected is Tesla. And last year, the last time I looked at Tesla and its 200-day moving average, about 180% above it. So maybe there, that's why Elon Musk likes Bitcoin so much. They both, they run hot. He gets it. He gets it. He gets it. All right. Have a good weekend. Abigail Doolittle, uh, Bloomberg News Markets reporter. All right. Right over to Dave Wilson, our stocks editor. Uh, Dave, your stock of the day. Hannon Armstrong Sustainable Infrastructure Capital. Quite a mouthful. The company <laughs> provides uh, financing for alternative energy projects. It was organized as a real estate investment trust by Hannon Armstrong, a Maryland-based firm founded in 1981. The REIT went public in 2013. The ticker is HASI. The shares climbed 69% in 2019 and 97% last year. Now, this year, they set a record on January 7th before sliding as much as 23% through yesterday. Hannon Armstrong recouped a bunch of that loss after putting out fourth quarter results late yesterday. Earnings and revenue beat analyst average estimates in the Bloomberg survey, and the company forecast a profit gauge would climb as much as 10% annually in the next three years. The results and outlook sent Hannon Armstrong shares to their biggest gain since May. They were up as much as 17% during the day, closed higher by about 10.5%. All right, Dave Wilson, thank you so much. So good to see you in the office today, and hopefully we'll see you soon on a regular basis. This is the here. first time Dave Wilson and I got to meet in person. <laughs> they're like, they're real. They're real, Dave. It was great, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Be well. Stay safe. Um, we didn't get to talk about Kim and Kanye. No, we didn't. Uh, TMZ reporting that they are filing for divorce. There's our week in a, in a nutshell. And ABC News as well. <laughs> exactly. You have a good week. Thank you. You too. Be well. All right. Let's get to World of National News over to Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nancy. 
Hey, Carol, President Biden is touting his administration's performance in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic after touring a Pfizer facility in Michigan. The drug company's CEO, Albert Borla, also applauded Biden's work, saying he's demonstrated an understanding of the urgency of the moment and shown deep compassion. Biden says we're still in the teeth of the pandemic, but making our way out. We're now at a point where we've seen the average daily number of people vaccinated nearly double from the week before I took office to about 1.7 million average per day getting a shot. Biden says the U.S. will have enough vaccine for everyone by the end of July, although he says it may take a while longer to have those vaccines in arms. He urged everyone to receive a vaccine when they do qualify. Winter weather is having a ripple effect on vaccine distribution. COVID-19 Task Force Advisor Andy Slavitt says deliveries are expected through the weekend to make up for a three-day delay in shipping. We have a backlog of about 6 million doses due to the weather. All 50 states have been impacted. Slavitt says he expects the backlog doses to be delivered next week at the latest. Federal transportation officials are looking to hire more than 6,000 security officers nationwide by the summer. It's due to signs that more people are opting to take trips as COVID-19 vaccinations progress. The Transportation Security Administration says it plans to recruit at approximately 430 airports all across the country. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. This is Bloomberg. All right, Nance, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser in our interactive broker studio. So uh, earlier this week, Tim and I caught up with Hormel Foods Chairman, CEO, and President Jim Sney. They had earnings out. Uh, they were in line when it came to uh, earnings. They were a little bit better when it came to sales. And they also talked about the outlook, and they seem pretty optimistic going forward. Jim Snee, who is the company's CEO, we talked about a lot of different things. And here's a little snippet from that conversation. And uh, Mr. Snee talking specifically about why they acquired planters and how it fits into the company's overall branding. This is a business that fits in our portfolio so perfectly. I mean, it, it starts with it, it's an iconic brand. You know, so when you think about the brands, and, and Carol, you mentioned a whole bunch of them at the top, you know, our brands are so well-known, so well-recognized, and we know how to manage brands. We're great stewards of brands, and so Spam, Skippy, and now Planters, is, you know, they've been around for a long time. We know how to nurture them. Uh, planters happens to be in a very, very attractive category for us, the snacking category. And so we've already got a, a pretty well-developed snacking business, but it, it's across all parts of the company. Um, this is really an opportunity for us to focus in, in the snack nuts. And if you think about how much it makes sense, when you think about the Skippy business we have, the Justin's business we have, this is just a, a natural evolution of, of that portfolio. The other thing that it does for us is, you know, over time, we've been very intentional about being less and less of a, a commodity meat company. Huh. And some of the acquisitions we've made over over the last several years have really moved us further down that path. And so this is this is just another step. And you know, what, what's even more exciting is by far it's the largest acquisition our, our company's ever made. It was just about a week ago or so, give or take, uh, that Hormel agreed to buy the planter snack brand brand, excuse me, from Kraft Heinz. It was a $3.35 billion cash deal. So check out that full conversation. You can find it at Bloomberg.com. That was the Hormel Foods Chairman, CEO, and President Jim Snee. You are listening to Bloomberg Radio.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellock. Turned out to be a mixed day. Stocks finished mostly lower as benchmark treasury yields climbed to the highest in a year, renewing concern that rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. S&P down seven, lower by two tenths of one percent. The Dow up one point, little change there. Nasdaq up nine, a gain of one tenth of one percent. Now for the week, S&P 500 index fell seven tenths of one percent. The Dow eked out a gain this week of one tenth of one percent. Holiday shortened week, Nasdaq fell this week by one point six percent. Ten-year yield, everybody's watching that one point three three percent right now. We have got gold up three tenths of one percent, seventeen eighty one the ounce, and West Texas intermediate crude down two and a half percent. Oil declining as production begins to come back online. Natural gas lower by three tenths of one percent, three oh seven per million BTUs. Citigroup said to be considering divesting some foreign consumer units. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie. Thank you so much. Well, the state of Texas uh, calling off its emer energy emergency. We got that earlier today. They did say their power grid is back to normal. We also saw natural gas futures fluctuating today as the energy crisis plaguing the central U.S. eased amid an outlook for milder weather and a decline in blackouts. It was, though, a volatile week in the energy markets, and we know very, very tough on a lot of Americans, uh, certainly in those hard-hit uh, areas across the country, particularly Texas. Let's get some insight, though, on what's been going on in the natural gas industry here in the U.S. Let's bring in Karen Harbert. She is president and CEO of the American Gas Association. They represent more than 200 local energy companies, uh, which are delivering nat gas around the U.S. They've got about 72 million customers in the U.S. And basically, if you get nat gas here in the U.S., you probably have uh, one of their companies or one of their members. All right, Karen joins us on the phone in D.C. Karen, nice to have you here. How are you? Well, Carol, thanks so much for having me. And thank goodness we're, we're warm and healthy here in D.C. And I hope you are in New York. And we're working hard in Texas and Louisiana and many other parts of our country that have been challenged. Well, that's what I want to ask you about those challenges. What are you hearing from your members about supplies and service outages nationally and to Texas specifically, which, as we know, has been deeply affected as a result of the weather? Absolutely. Well, there's a word that we have gotten way too accustomed to using uh, lately. It's called unprecedented. Mm. Uh, this was an unprecedented uh, challenge uh, for our industry, and we really stepped up. And we set a new two-day record for the delivery of natural gas on Sunday and Monday of this week, delivering more than we ever have in our country's history and second to none of the polar vortex at the end of January in 2019. So we dug deep into our toolbox and reap the benefits of a lot of advanced planning, and we're able to, to meet all of our customers' demands that are hooked up to natural gas at their home or business. Having said that, though, there are still a lot of people who don't have it, correct? Well, there's certainly still some power uh, grid failures in, in Texas and, and a couple other spots. Uh, but for those homes that use natural gas to cook with or light their fireplace or heat their hot water, uh, we were delivering 24-7, 365. So everybody's been taken care of unless, unless, as you said, they're tied somehow to the grid and it's it, 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 making it difficult for them to access. Yeah, the power generation in, in Texas is different. It's its own market, right. so it's limited in its ability to tap into other parts of the country to import power. But fortunately, on the natural gas side, we had supply within Texas. We okay. do a lot of investing during the summer. Uh, and put gas in underground storage, and we pulled a lot of that out of storage to keep the market supplied. Well, you know, to that point, um, Karen, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, he restricted the flow of nat natural gas across state lines and that any gas in the state of Texas be offered to state power generators before it could be shipped out of Texas. Was that the right thing to do? Well, I don't know if it was necessary, but, mm. uh, you know, he sits at the seat of power and is trying to defend and, you know, the, the, the rights of his citizens. I'm not even actually sure if it's, it's illegal or not, but that's not for me to decide. Right. But we didn't need it on our side. You uh, didn't because need it. We, had, we didn't need it. Well, that's... So we had enough, and yeah. we have enough still in storage. It's above average, five-year average. So we've got supply and production has been, re, you know, coming back online as you pointed out in the setup to this. Uh, so we've got gas coming in. 
that's new and stuff that's underground. What have your members learned, though, Karen, about this process? I mean, obviously, Texas, I have a lot of family uh, throughout the state of Texas. Um, this is not something that typically happens, but climate change is <laughs> constantly reminding us that things that don't normally happen when it comes to weather patterns and climate um, that's being upended. So what needs to change within your members and, and in, or how are they going to change things going, going differently in terms of being prepared for what have you or those unprecedented actions? Sure. Well, the first thing is, is that planning matters. And we plan for the coldest day of the year 365 days a year because mm -hmm. that's when, when warmth and heat matter most. And Texas is normally focused on what the 110 degree day with high demand for air conditioning, uh, not the 10 degree day for heating. But our industry uh, is obliged uh, to plan for that coldest day, and they do, which is why we enter into long term contracts so we've got the supply and can tap it when we need it. I'll also have to say on the infrastructure side, the gas utilities spend about $90 million every day improving the safety and resiliency of our delivery system, the two and a half million miles of pipeline we have. So we really need to be looking at what, what needs to be done in a market like Texas to ensure that the infrastructure is up to the challenge. And it was not. Well, certainly the, uh, some of the infrastructure that was above ground uh, was Had deeply problems. challenged. The, the natural gas pipelines are, are mostly underground except for some of our compressor stations. Uh, so we have a way to inoculate our customers uh, because of the way our infrastructure is displayed in, throughout the country. So I guess I guess the takeaway from the conversations you're having with your members um, who are all part of and really you know comprise the nat gas industry in the United States, what do we need to take away or what do we need to learn or what do we need to do differently going forward? Well, I think as we look at what happened in Texas, and we're going to be studying that for weeks, if not months to come, right. the partnership between the utility industry is really important because they're all interdependent. Natural gas, electricity, water came into play. There were water failures. And even the IT infrastructure, uh, the Internet came down in places, which was hard to communicate you know, amongst the communities. So we really need to take a hard look that we're all working together. So when electricity comes on, uh, we've got the gas supply right there to make sure that the heating comes back on at the same moment and it doesn't happen all at once. And that worked pretty well, but unfortunately, you know, we are now at Friday yeah. uh, and this has been going on, you know, a week. Exactly, exactly. Karen, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. It's certainly been a story that we've been following closely and good to get some insight um, from your members and the industry overall. Karen Harbert, she's president and CEO at the American Gas Association, joining us on the phone from Washington, D.C. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Carol Masser, and this is Bloomberg Radio.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, coming up, uh, we're going to wrap up our week with a great guest, Matt Kaplan, the founder and CEO of Ace Entertainment. He is focused on creating content for youth audiences, so we'll talk about that, and also to a project he's just wrapping up. All right, let's get a check, though, on your top business stories. Once again, over to Charlie All Pellet. All right, thank you very much. The Dow Ace to win for the week, uh, up by one point today on the week, up barely up by one-tenth of one percent. Holiday shortened trading week. We'll give you the weekly numbers first. A losing week for the S&P, down this week by one uh, by a seven-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ this week, down 1.6 percent. Today, stocks finished mostly lower benchmark treasury yields climbing to the highest in a year, renewing concern that rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. S&P 500 index, if you are watching the screen, turn negative in the final few minutes of trading today, ending lower for the first week in three. S&P today down seven, a drop of two-tenths of one percent. The uh, S&P ending the week of 3906. The Dow 31,494 up today by a point virtually flat on the day. NASDAQ up nine, a gain of about one-tenth of one percent. Again, that 10-year 1.33 percent. Gold up four-tenths of one percent, 1782 the ounce. And West Texas Intermediate crude down 2.6 percent, 58.95 a barrel. Oil declining as U.S. production begins to come back online. Natural gas lower today by five-tenths of one percent. 306 per million BTUs. Now, what about the Federal Reserve? Next week, we will be hearing from Jay Powell. Kate Moore is head of thematic strategy at BlackRock Financial, and she was interviewed today on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm going to take the Fed at its word at this point that even after the economy begins to recover, and even if we start to see inflation percolating, which I think is kind of a consensus view at this point throughout the course of 2021. They're going to take out the base effects component and really try and figure out what is more sort of structural versus just a comp to a really low inflation environment in 2020. So I'm not looking for a massive move in terms of policy rates, even if, you know, the, the yield curve moves a little bit. A single dose of the vaccine from Pfizer and BioNTech reduced COVID-19 infections by 85% in a study in Israel bolstering the UK's decision to speed immunizations by delaying a second shot, that according to a report in the Lancet Medical Journal. Pfizer shares uh, up, uh, down today, Pfizer lower by four-tenths of one percent, BioNTech was up today by 2.7%. Recapping stocks mixed, S&P down seven, a drop of two-tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. So great way to wrap up our day and our week. And perhaps if you're looking for something to watch over the weekend, or maybe your teenagers are, uh, let's bring in Matt Kaplan. He is the founder and CEO of Ace Entertainment. They make feature films, TV series, and digital content all geared toward the youth audiences. And uh, Matt is also producer of To All the Boys I've Loved Before. It's the third and final film out this month, airing on Netflix based on the best-selling book and its sequels. Matt joins us on the phone in Los Angeles. Matt, ha nice to have you here. How are you? Thank you. I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. And I am curious. We want to get into uh, to all the boys in just a moment, but I want to ask you about what's what's your world like? I mean, what kind of production work, <laughs> you know, did you need to get done even during the pandemic? What's it been like? Yeah, you know, it's been been incredible i mean obviously first things first has been safety and trying to find ways to, to put all these people back to work and all of the ppe and and i think i've been tested now 72 times since uh, wow. september um you know i think it's and, and that has come first but but we've actually been managing uh the, you know the process and and so far so good doing it in bubbles is that what's been going on or zones yeah kind of yeah. bubble yeah g bubbles and, and kind of various people are like bubbled together if you will and, and ultimately uh it's actually worked and, and we've gotten through two movies already without having any covid cases so well that we've been successful congratulations because that's a really good thing and i mean i do feel like for a while we know everything shut down we talked to uh, a lot of folks in the industry last year and everything just shut down it's coming back or it is you know obviously i'm assuming not at the same levels but things are coming back 
Yeah, we're, we're getting back to work definitely from about March till July. It was pretty dead um, for obvious reasons. And, and we were lucky enough to be able to finish our final uh, to all the boys I loved before uh, three. So that was very exciting for us. Well, talk to us about wrapping that up. Uh, I know Near and Dear, it's a, tril- a trilogy, excuse me. So what did it feel like to kind of bring it to, to an end? Yeah, it was it was sad but exciting, right? I mean, you know, this is a journey I've been on for five years since we um, optioned the book five years ago from from the author and and then put it together. You know, we at our company we, we want to bring young stories to the screen, and ultimately it, this one obviously really connected. And, and Netflix has been an amazing partner through the process of making sure that it's getting out to a global audience. Well, talk to me a little bit too about choosing Netflix because from what I understood, I, I was reading in. Um, before this interview and just uh, reading about some of the other things that you've said that you got, you did have offers to go the movie theater route, but you didn't. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just felt like at the time, again, this is three years ago now, and Netflix was, was a growing company and they were focused on growing internationally. And, and this story felt really personal to the author in a way that she wanted the Korean American young teenage experience to get out there globally. And I felt like, you know, kids and teenagers specifically uh, were on Netflix. And so it, it, we started to look at the financials and whether that was a hit theatrically or going to a streaming service, what was most important what was we got the eyeballs. And so we were able to, to sell the movie to Netflix, and they've been an amazing distribution and marketing partner. I know. When you're thinking about hundreds of millions <laughs> of eyeballs, uh, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. And I do wonder, as someone who creates content, and you're obviously playing in all different worlds, I mean, you know, where are we in terms of streaming versus the big screen? Obviously, the pandemic changed our world, turned it upside down. Does some of that continue, you think, on the other side? I'm excited to see, you know, I think on both, I can see both scenarios happening, right? Kids obviously are going to be home watching Netflix. It's it's a price point that makes a lot of sense for the amount of content you get. That being said, uh, you know, I think young people still want to be able to go out with their friends and get out of the house, especially I think when, when hopefully this is all behind us, uh, meaning the pandemic, I think kids are going to want to go back to the theaters, I hope. So we'll see how it evolves. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I do wonder, just got about 30 seconds here, and then we'll come back and talk some more. Do you still expect that there might be releases still that come out on streaming as well as the big screen that will see kind of that multiple play? Yeah, definitely. I think you're going to see, I mean, HBO Max already announced a lot of theirs coming out in theaters and streaming at the same time, and, and I think that that's, that's something that I'm super interested in. Uh, how that how that goes down. All right, Matt, sit tight for a second. We're going to do a little bit of news, but we'll come back. We're talking with Matt Kaplan, uh, the founder and CEO of Asa Entertainment. I want to talk a little bit more about where he's taking his company and the type of uh, projects that uh, he is looking to develop going forward. In the meantime, let's get another check on world and national news for that over the nation's capital. And Nancy Lyons, she is in our D.C. newsroom. Hi, Nance. Hey there, Carol. Happy Friday. President Biden has completed a tour of the Pfizer facility in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Michigan. He saw firsthand how the vaccines are being produced. He applauded the workers there for the job they're doing. This is an incredibly complex process. And at every stop, safety is the utmost priority. The whole process takes teamwork, precision, and round-the-clock focus. Pfizer Chief Executive Officer Albert Borla says... His company will expand manufacturing and work with new suppliers to ramp up production of the COVID-19 vaccine. The Biden administration says it does expect to have enough vaccines for every American by the end of July. Biden's COVID-19 task force said today that they're facing a delivery backlog of about 6 million doses due to the bad weather. They hope most of those doses will reach their destinations by early next week. Well, those winter storms that have blanketed much of the U.S. in snow and ice could end up costing the country up to $50 billion in damage and economic loss. That's according to an estimate from AccuWeather. Dan Halliburton is with Red Cross and says conditions in Texas are extremely difficult right now. It's a slow rolling mess of misery. And and it reminds me of what kind of happens after a hurricane where so much of the infrastructure is devastated and so much is offline. 
While power is being restored across Texas, water outages continue to plague the state. More than 14 million are affected, with 160 Texas counties under water boil notices. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nance, thank you so much. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week and our Bloomberg Business Week weekend show featuring an interview that we did earlier in the week. It was with Impossible Foods President Dennis Woodside, and we talked about a lot of things. They had some news, actually, uh, earlier this month, and this was about cutting their faux meat prices by 20% at grocery stores. In this clip from the interview, he talks about when plant-based products will be as cheap, cheap as beef. Listen up. If you think about what we what we do, we take plants and we turn them directly into meat. And what the animal does, it's, the animal's kind of an intermediary that, uh, that, that requires a lot more land, a lot of water, a lot of labor, a lot of transportation, oil, gas to move uh, cows around, that sort of thing. Uh, so in theory, our product should be much lower priced than, uh, than cows over time. But it just takes time for us to optimize the supply chain to scale up. Uh, you know, animal-based uh, meat today is less than 1% of the total meat consumed in the U.S., uh, but that's going to change pretty rapidly. And as that does, the cost for the whole industry, including us, will come down, and we'll be able to compete much more aggressively on price. But timeline-wise, though, is there – are you thinking, you know, in years that you can count on one hand, or, or is this like a decades-long progression? Absolutely. No, abso- absolutely years that you can count on one hand. There are portions of our product now or elements of our product now that – are, are at the cost of the cow, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of processing costs and transportation costs, packaging, all those things that we have not yet fully optimized, and that take that just take time and scale to get right. So the packaging, what what the actual uh, product shows up in on shelf, that's expensive. Uh, but as you get bigger, the, those costs come down. All right, and that was uh, Impossible Foods President Dennis Woodside talking about his industry, his company, and that recent cut uh, in their prices by 20% at grocery stores. You can check out that full interview. It's in our weekend show uh, on Bloomberg Radio, and it's also on our podcast feed at Bloomberg.com. He also talked about R&D spending and where he anticipates this whole industry is going. A lot of innovation happening, uh, and they are certainly uh, focusing a lot of efforts on it. So check out that interview again at Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Radio.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks finished mostly lower as benchmark treasury yields climbed to the highest of the year, renewing concern that rising borrowing costs and price pressures could derail the economic recovery. S&P turning negative in the final few minutes of trading. We did see a seesaw session here with the S&P swinging between gains and losses, but right at the close, S&P down 7, lower today by about two-tenths of 1%. By the way, for the week, S&P 500 index uh, did decline uh, this week, down by about uh, one uh, by uh, seven tenths of one percent. The Dow on the week positive, up one tenth. Nasdaq this week down one point six percent. Ten-year yield one point three three percent. Gold up six forty the ounce, up by four tenths of one percent. Seventeen eighty two the ounce. West Texas intermediate crude uh, crude uh, declining today as U.S. production begins to come back online. WTI down two point six percent. Fifty eight ninety four a barrel. Cannot ignore Bitcoin. 55,616 right now on Bitcoin, up today by 6.9%. Recapping stocks mixed, S&P down 7, down 2 tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Appreciate that update. Want to get right back to uh, Matt Kaplan. He's the founder and CEO of Ace Entertainment, and he's also the producer of To All the Boys I've Loved Before, that third and final film out this month uh, airing on Netflix. Hey, Matt, one thing I want to ask you about how you are focusing specifically on YA content, youth audiences. Tell me why. Yeah, I mean, look, when I was younger growing up, we, we saw a lot of fun movies like John Hughes was producing, Ferris Bueller, Chaos, et cetera. Um, and then slowly we've just seen franchises kind of take over with the, in the superhero space. And so I kind of realized as the streamers started to kind of get more popular that that was an area I, I grew up on and loved and and kids that still would want to hear these teenage stories being told time and time again. And with the rise of social media, they finally had a platform to be able to connect and, and talk about um, what was going on globally. And I think now you've seen kind of more and more YA content being well, uh, produced. Well, yeah. And so talk to me about that access to content, because it's an interesting time. We've talked about it a lot around uh, our table here in our studio about it's a great time to be a content creator because there's streaming, there's the big screen, there's traditional, there's linear. There's just so much stuff going on. How hard is it or how expensive is it to acquire great content or create it? I mean, I think, look, what matters most to us is, is finding great stories and breaking new talent. So ultimately, if, if there's a book like the last film we just finished is by Jennifer E. Smith called Statistical Probability of Love at First Sight. Um, and it was a big best-selling book that was focused on young people. And ultimately, it hadn't gotten produced yet. And it was something we were super passionate about. So uh, we just decided to go off and make it. And it'll find the right home wherever that's supposed to land. And, and ultimately, um, whether that goes theatrically or to streaming services, you know, we, we as content creators just want eyeballs on our content. Right, right. But I mean, in terms of going after it, is there are there bidding wars for things right now because there are so many different. Yeah, yeah that's what I, I'm curious about. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you know again with the pandemic and with great content, ultimately, um, multiple people now are, are reaching out about the movies that we're making. But but I think it's because young people want more of it, and I think these streaming services are seeing that. Um, new content and fresh fresh stories are what matter, and that clearly must be driving subscription. So, and in terms of finding funding, you know, is it pretty accessible in this environment? Because certainly when we think about the financial markets, there's a lot of money chasing a lot of investments. Um, there's a lot of money just out there, you know, searching for yield. And I am curious about uh, more and more money going into the content creation or out in Hollywood. We've got a lot of folks on Wall Street who end up, you know, producing or f providing the backing uh, for content creation, whether it's a big movie or, or something else. What are you seeing in that world? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that you see a lot of producers out in Hollywood now raising money. And, and you know, if you're doing it for smart prices um, that you feel can reach a global audience, then I think the money is there. And now with all the various ways of social media, I think marketing the movies is becoming a little bit easier despite obviously theatrically that you know the marketing costs have exploded so i think for us a lot of the digital spends on a financial level have been really smart because our audiences are on tiktok and snapchat and the various uh, social media platforms 
Yeah, it's also, you know, it's, it, having consumed a lot of content over the last year, it is, I find, kind of things have changed a little bit. The model, it doesn't necessarily have to be you create something, especially when you're talking about series, where it comes back year after year. It can be a limited run. And that's got to be, I'm thinking, you know, as someone who is creating content, it's kind of freeing, isn't it? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, again, we we always want to see if there's the right story can go over a couple movies or, or series, obviously. But, but, you know, again, with To All the Boys, there was three books, and we felt like that was the exact time that we needed to tell those stories. So uh, that's what we did. Right. The arc. Like, you don't have to kind of push it beyond. Um, what's next for you? Um, more of the same. You know, I think we just, I just told you, we, we just finished the statistical probability, and, and we're going to continue to produce about 10 films over the next 18 months. Um, all focused in the kind of young adult space because uh, we feel like that's an area that, that is underserved and, and we're going to continue to try to uh, expand that way. Do you feel like a year from now that things will be much more closer to normal? Quote, unquote, you know, this is something that in our conversations with medical experts, we heard from the president earlier in terms of he's there, uh, was earlier in a Pfizer factory. You know, it does feel like vaccines are coming out. Do you feel like though a year from now it'll feel a lot more normal? Yeah, I mean, the hope is that, you know, people want to go back to movie theaters, obviously, and, and, and a safe way to do that on, on a production level. Um, I think we've actually gotten to a rhythm that will probably remain this way for quite some time in terms of producing the content, uh, because we just want to make sure everyone's safe. And so, yeah, hope, hopefully another 12 months will be in a really different spot. Yeah, fingers crossed on that one. Um, Matt, thank you yeah. so much. Really appreciate it. Matt Kaplan, he's the chief executive officer of Ace Entertainment. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, he's also the producer of To All the Boys I've Loved Before, that third and final film uh, out this month airing on Netflix. Just a reminder, we've got the Bloomberg Business Week weekend show coming up. Uh, and uh, you heard a little bit of a tease before. We've got the Impossible Foods president, Dennis Woodside. They made some news earlier this month and also... Uh, uh, we talked with uh, Lionel Barber, who's the former Financial Times editor-in-chief. He's got a new book out called The Powerful and the Damned, Private Diaries in Turbulent Times. He has seen so much during his tenure of 15 years as editor-in-chief at, FT, at the FT and really just talks about some of the big power players behind all of these big stories and being in the room where things were happening. So uh, a really, really great interview. Uh, coming up next, though, is Sound On with Kevin Cirilli, and he's getting ready. Uh, what are you covering? We're going to talk about uh, President Biden's Munich Security Conference mm. speech, and I've got two former State Department officials, one former State Department official from the Obama White House, another from the Trump White House, and I got them both on a panel together. Who says I can't bring people together? <laughs> and then we're going to kick things off with Congressman Joni Arrington, who is a Republican from Texas, and yes, I will be asking him about that cruise, can or the Cancun cruise. How do I get what I'm saying? Cancun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Cancun yeah, yeah. Cruise. Cancun. I'm, I'm cruise. not, I'm staying in DC this weekend, Carol. I'm not going to Cancun. I, I okay? haven't been to Cancun. I haven't been anywhere. I don't know about you, Kevin. I haven't been anywhere. You in know, over people a year. like us follow the rules. People like us follow the rules. <laughs> We're Have a great weekend, my friend. <laughs> Have a great show and a great weekend. All right, everyone. Just wrapping up, just a reminder of where we closed in terms of trading on this Friday. As we mentioned, it was kind of a funny little week. Uh, but by the end of the week, over the past five, Five days. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average just up two tenths of a percent. The S and P in the other direction, just down about uh, a quarter of a percent. We did see the Nasdaq lower though by one percent. Do you want to thank all of our team? Uh, Sarah Livesey, Reggie Bazile, Marufa Hossein, Chris Tricomi, Tim Harrow, Charlie Vollmer, Donnie Holloway, Ariel Agami, and Paul Brennan. Because it does take a village to put it all together. Have a safe weekend, everyone. And like I said, be sure to check out our Bloomberg Business Week weekend show, some interesting surprises, and our extra podcast. Also, that Hormel CEO talking about food innovation. Really some cool stuff. For Tim Stanovic, my co-host, I'm Carol Masser. As I said, have a good and safe weekend. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.